everyone. Welcome to Know Your Gear QA 244 on New Year's Eve. We did it. We made it to the end of the year. <laughs> Sometimes, uh, you know, that's an accomplishment, as we know, in itself. Um, so, as you know, this show is a little early, uh, because that way I can spend a little time with the family this afternoon, and... Um, and uh, we have something special today. So before I get started with the special stuff, let's talk about the easy stuff that we talk about. If you're trying to get a question or subject to me, please put a question mark first, uh, or the at Phil McKnight uh, will kind of get my attention too. Super chats, I try to answer as many as those as possible. Uh, same thing with the other questions, anything that's interesting, I try to hit that stuff. And uh, if you're watching the rebroadcast, I timestamp all the subjects, and then whatever usually we talk about the longest will usually becomes the title of the show. So that being said, I have some cool stuff. I want to start with something cool. So I was able to get a jalapeno beer. Uh, this is Ranch Rider Spirits uh, Ranch Water <laughs> uh, with real jalapenos. No, jalapenos. And, uh, and um, oh, I forget now. And I got to give him credit because he started this whole mess. Uh, <laughs> which, which viewer did this? It was two weeks ago. It was... Oh, man, I feel bad. It was... I know the name is crazy. It's a crazy sign-on. I might not be able to give credit because it's too far back, and I don't... I should have I should have tagged it. And I do apologize because you deserve the credit. So basically what happened was somebody super chatted me $5 and said, buy a jalapeno beer, and I thought that was funny. And uh, so I went to the local spirit store that's like one of those in-depth spirit stores, uh, you know, what's a wine and more kind of thing, and they didn't have any, they said... So I asked you guys to send me suggestions. You guys sent tons of them. And this is the one I found. It wasn't for any particular reason. Then it was just when I was Google searching, this one came up off of your suggestions first. And and again, while I'm talking, I'm still looking for the name and I'm not going to be able to find it. And I, again, I apologize uh, because uh, I like to give credit. Yep, can't find it. So, and I, I don't want to spend too long looking for it. So uh, I will I will give credit when I can. Uh, so anyway, so what happened was, um, I got the beers. <laughs> There's a little bit of a funny story to it. Uh, here's the funny story. Uh, it was $16 for a four pack and I wanted to make sure it was here today. So I had to pay to expedite the shipping and the expedited shipping was like, uh, like $18. <laughs> I don't know if that math works out. Cause I think it was $32 in whole. And the reason that's funny was my wife saw it because it came through the, uh, the business account. Because I was like, well, it's for the show. And so I I'm actually, it's just because I think that's a little card I had. So I used it. And uh, my wife goes, did you spend $32 on a case of beer? And I said, no. And she's like, oh, okay. I go, I, I spent $32 on four beers. <laughs> and then she looked at me and I said, well, it's for the show. And then she said, uh, maybe I should watch the show more. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this cool pint glass. It's chilled uh, from Six Bar Break, which is a band that sent this in to me once. And uh, what are we going to do? I'm going to drink this beer while I talk to you guys. I have some water, too. We'll see how bad it is. And uh, here's what we're going to do. Super easy. Uh, if I don't finish the beer, I will donate $50 to uh, St. Jude's Children's Hospital, which is a children's hospital that saved my son's life a few years back. And so I like to donate them just like Guitars for Vets. I tend to do charities that have affected my life in some way or are connected to the things I do, like music and things like that. And um, it's got a got a weird look. It looks like uh, that, that looks something, huh? <laughs> Grapefruity. I don't even think, that doesn't even smell like beer. I don't know what that smells like. There's definitely jalapeno in there. Anyway, so here's the deal. If I don't finish it, I will give $50 to St. Jude's Hospital. Uh, and if I do finish it, I will give $100. So I'm going to finish it because that's the way I would do it. If you want to donate to them, please do not super chat me. Please. Uh, do. There's a link down below if you want to donate to that charity if you feel so inspired. I'm not asking to. I'm just telling you if you feel inspired. Please, the reason I say don't super chat me is because then I have to figure out and track it. And YouTube gets about 30 something percent of the super chats. And let's not give YouTube money if we could give that straight to charity, right? I'd rather you just give that 30% to charity. So um, we're gonna take a drink. <laughs> Happy New Year and cheers to everyone. I'll do the. Okay, here we go, jalapeno beer. Okay. So what it tastes like 
is jalapenos. It's like somebody put jalapenos in seltzer. The beer, the beer. It's, I was picturing like a beer. And this might be different because of what I got. Because it doesn't say beer on it now that I see it. It says Ranch Rider Spirits. I might have messed this all up. It's a tequila seltzer. That's what you get for not paying attention. Well, I was paying attention. I, t I typed in this name and it said beer. Well, it's a tequila seltzer. We're going to go with it. You know what? You know what? It's lower on the carbs. That's good. It's gluten free. So that's that's good. It, if I, that's probably why I probably was not paying attention and was looking for this. So um, it's not great. <laughs> it's like uh, imagine a jalapeno white claw for those of you who had a white claw. That's jalapeno fla flavored white claw. Yeah, there's no way two of these are going down. Okay, what's the percentage of alcohol in this? Is it the same? Somewhere on here. I tell you guys all the time, I hate it when I'm looking at stuff on the show because to you guys, the room is bright. To me, I'm flooded with light in front of me and it's dark in here. <laughs> so the light is, every, I really, to read, I need to look this way because that's the light. See how bright, when I go this way, you can see it, it's in the shadow, it's in the dark. So it's one of those illusions of the, 5.99, so 6% alcohol. All right, cool. All right, so it's basically health food, uh, Deanna says. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, it tastes like, <laughs> EJ says it tastes like cooked base strings. You're not wrong. <laughs> like, let me put it this way. If somebody told me uh, this was guitar polish, <laughs> I'd be like, I, I would believe that. It tastes like that. All right. Yeah. All right. Then it's not horrible, and you know it's not spicy. There's a little bit, of, a little bit of kick to it. Joe says, "Sounds like a fifty dollars donation." No, I will make it. I will make it through. I can't let 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 the kids down. You know how that works. All right. Hi, Desert says I have to. I have to um, what uh, listen to the podcast because I can't pay attention to the chat at the same time. Totally understand. If you watch it on your TV, you don't get the chat either, so that helps too. But yeah, more people uh, listen to the podcast than watch it on YouTube, so I'm not shocked by that. Uh, Rick says he'll stick with his Guinness. A lot of people say Guinness. Yeah. All right. So, all right. Uh, Vimp69 says agreed on the Guinness. I, I think I told you guys this. Uh, when it comes to Guinness, I like Guinness, but I like 1554 better. It's like a Belgian beer that I just like a lot. And it's got that same kind of dark... Uh, I dare, I dare never call Guinness a chocolatey beer, but that's kind of how I think of it. You know, like a dark chocolatey kind of vibe to it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, so B said, says I should donate the hundred dollars because of the colossal F up. Well, it's not really colossal F up. Like I said, I might've been looking for this because I am not drinking beer right now. As I've guys have said, I've been drinking uh, the seltzery stuff. So it might have filtered that way for, on purpose when I was looking. Because what happened was, although I was searching under beers on the names you gave me, I was paying attention to carbs and sugars and all that stuff. And so I probably saw this was the lowest carb, saw it on the list of names that you guys gave me, and I filtered to it and said, okay, that's the way to go. And I didn't realize that the reason the carbs were so low um, was, yeah, because it's 0 0.04 grams of sugar. So that's what it was. It was just, it was just lower carbs. So it, I did, I, I messed up and didn't grab the word beer. But this is actually better for me. <laughs> so, um, all right, there we go. Let's uh, let's get into the show. We got a lot of good questions and we got a lot of stuff to talk about. It's the end of the year. I did want to start with a negative, unfortunately, because it's going to come up. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard, but Betty White passed away. And of course, not only is that horrible news as always, because she's like, you know, I mean, we all love her. I mean, who hasn't seen Betty White and and loved her? And uh, she died at 99 years old and she was going to be 100 next month. And that just is a bummer on, on every level. But, you know, you got to look at the both things. And the one thing I'm trying to focus on, because it was a kind of a bummer, because I literally heard like 20 minutes before the show started, um, you know, 99 I mean, it's not the hundred, but man, to live to ninety-nine, what a what a great triumph! And to be successful and active and doing things, the things she loved and, and entertaining us all the way to the end is just fantastic. So, yeah, Joshua. Oh, by the way, anyone know when I'm telling this, this is confirmed. Betty White passed away. This isn't like a uh, 
you know, I, I uh, when my wife told me, I said, is that confirmed? And so my wife looked and it's been sourced and confirmed. So yeah, it's not just like some kind of prank people are pulling. At least it doesn't seem like it. I hope it is. I hope it is. I hope next week I'll be like, I'm sorry for that mistake. That would be even better. Um, so on that note, I think the best thing we can do is now get into the subjects of guitars and, uh, and try to have a, uh, you know, try to have a happy new year. It's, it's been a hor- horrible couple of years and, in, and a great couple of years, depending on which aspect you look at. And the fact that we have each other every Friday to hang out and talk is uh, what I'm going to focus on. And I'm going to do just that. So the first comment question I got today was, Hey, Phil, I hope you have a great new year's Eve or new year's it says, what would your, what would be my suggestion for a budget fret and dress tool? I have a ukulele that's uh, kind of my fingers. And that was from Polly and Polly. I did see your later comment that you were thinking about getting like, he said his wife's nail file. And look, you can use that kind of stuff on your fret. I don't suggest it. <laughs> um, cause really it's about, you got to take things down, smooth it out. Um, but the tool that I use is called a fret end dress file from Stu Mac. Um, it is expensive. Uh, it's uh, expensive cause if you buy just it, I think it's like 10 to $15, but then it's like 10 to $12 to ship it. So 20 something dollars. Um, but I will tell you that, and I will say this over to go and I have so many videos where I use it. Almost every video I've touched frets that file is in there. That file, and there's others like it, and I can't say all of them are good, but there's a few out there from other respected Luthery sites that I would trust. I do not trust any of the junk brand uh, you know, dealers of that file. Here's why. 20-something dollars on that file, I tell you guys over and over again, if you get good at that file, you will never need to pay anyone to do that work again. And... I would say if you're an at-home hobbyist, if you're an, uh, and, a, and a normal purchaser of guitars, whatever the hell that means, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, you'll get years out of that file. I mean, I mean, I use them. Think of this. I wear them down pretty quickly over time doing a lot of guitars. But even when I wear them down, I continue to use them because when they're worn down, they still have a kind of a cool effect at the end of some work, what you need. So the fret end dress file is what I recommend. In fact, I did a video and, there, and you can Google it or search it on YouTube where it's like uh, the tools I think every guitar player needs. And at the end, I show you, I think three files. Sounds right, could have been two, but whatever I'm showing you at the end, uh, cause I was in my shop, it wasn't supposed to be part of the video. The video was like all these tools. And at the end I held them up because I was thinking of questions you might ask. And I said, these three tools, I could do a fret job on any guitar. That's crown and level, everything. Yeah, so it was a crown and rounding file. Um, it was my six inch file and then my uh, fret dress tool. Those three files, I swear, I, I literally, uh, it's, it's, I can say something that's very unique and that hopefully helps you guys, which is some people can say, I can use those files and I can set up a guitar or, or do a fret job anywhere. What I can tell you is, uh, I'm putting my kids through college with the work I've done over the last, you know, decades repairing guitars with those files. So, I mean, they're effective. I mean, I work on customers' guitars and they like those guitars that I do with those files. So that's a big testament to those files. And overall, I think those three files, you're probably under $100 or around $100 and something dollars for all three. And uh, I don't necessarily think you should get all three, but uh, definitely take those uh, recommendations to heart. And that's like I said, if you, oh, somebody says, uh, sweet, uh, Stu Max got a 15% off today. That dude, anytime Stu Max got a discount, you take that sucker. I use them anytime they give me those coupons. I use them. Um, I didn't, I wasn't able to use, I just did a huge purchase at Sweetwater. It was like $2,300 this week. Um, and sadly enough, I didn't have the coupon, but I couldn't wait for the coupon. I needed to make the purchase. So it was here in time. Um, but, uh, those files, Fred and dress, uh, the six inch uh, 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 leveling file and then the uh, uh, crown rel- level file. It's whatever. I don't know the names because I mean, I mean, literally, if you look in those videos, I've had those files for, I mean, at least 15 years. So that you can see how worn down they are. I even have new ones. If you see in the shop, you'll see new ones hanging on the wall. And I, it's just because I'm still using the original ones, but I have the new ones in case. Is that true? I didn't, BC, which uh, 5B1 says Stu Mac has a $2,500 minimum for free shipping. I didn't know that. I literally just spent $2,300. <laughs> and the worst part is I removed probably about three, $400 of stuff out of my cart. I was like, ah, I can hold off until February for that stuff. It's all stuff for obviously for, for the shop and stuff, but that's, well, BC Rich, I will definitely check into that because not that the ship, I think the shipping was 25 bucks or something like that. It wasn't heinous. So the problem is Wes Shipman says Amazon $20 free shipping. Here's the thing with uh, 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 
Stu Mac, and I want to be very clear. And again, I can't, I can't say if you know because things change, and I haven't checked in months. But um, if you notice, whenever I talk about Stu Mac product, I don't affiliate link Stu Mac product, and the reason is is because they don't have a link affiliate link to them directly. And I have an Amazon affiliate link, so I could use that, but I don't use it because uh, Stu Mac upcharges. So everything at Stu Mac is 10 to 20% higher on Amazon. So you're paying that shipping sometimes, you know what I mean? Or you are. So I don't recommend you buy the stuff at Stu Mac uh, on, on Amazon. Um, I've talked to Brock, uh, who's the, one of the, v- the VP at, at Stu Mac. I asked him about that. And because um, I've, you know, I haven't talked to him in probably about a year. Uh, close to it. I, maybe I talked at the beginning of this year. I don't remember. But the last conversation we had was I was telling him you guys' issues that the viewers think the shipping is ridiculously high. And he said he knows. And I didn't, eh, he's not going to do anything about it, but he knows. And uh, he said, well, there's free shipping, I think he said, on Amazon. And I said, yeah, but don't you guys like up the... And he's like, well, we have to up the charge to pay all the Amazon fees. So uh, just, just, yeah, just be aware of that, guys. There's, you know, there's no deal there to be suggested. So otherwise, like I said, I would send you there because not only it would be cheaper for you, but I would get affiliate dollars out of it or something. It would, you know, put put some coin in the, in the show. But yeah, Philip says you pay somehow. Yeah, usually the, that's usually how it works. What I tell everybody is, man, if you can, I used to do this before I could just do it on my own. Stu Mac, how I used to get stuff done at Stu Mac was I would find friends and go, hey, do you need anything from Stu Mac? I'm going to make an order this week. <laughs> and if I could, you know what I mean? And then... And then get that, the shipping, get the price so that they didn't kill you on the shipping. Cause it's that, that minimum shipping thing sucks. It's tough. It's a tough thing. And then Sunbase says, if you use sweet water, or Stu Mac, I always say sweet water, sorry, Stu Mac enough. Uh, you can spend the $35 for the Stu Mac Max membership uh, that gives you free shipping. It's also a good idea too, especially if you're spending enough stuff. Okay, so let's get, uh, let's, uh, let's, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, Nishad, Nishad, I'm sorry if I say your name wrong, says, Phil, would you recommend the Stumac Z file? I'm not a big fan, but I've, I've, I've told everybody this. Um, it's not that it's a bad file. It's a great file. I just like my, my files that I've had from Stumac prior better. And the reason is, is everybody's looking for these, like, it's different different perspectives of what they're trying to do. And the reason I say that uh, and the reason I'm so cautious why I say this is because it's, I don't want to imply that there's a bad way to do something. There isn't. The problem is, is a lot of times I don't want things that are really aggressive. What I mean by that is I don't want files that are like, oh, it's really great because it's like really, you know, like it's diamond or whatever the deal is. I I like fighting to take material off things. I know it's more work and I know it's more, you know, strenuous, but I find uh, I my I live in a constant like I don't want to take too much material away from anything. I don't want to do anything that I have to fix <laughs> when I'm fixing something, right? The worst thing you do when you're fixing something is create a problem you got to fix more. So So there you go. I uh, the Z file is it's okay, but I'm I'm not I'm not a it's not my thing. Yeah, Philip uh, says that just looks nasty. It's uh, it's you know what it is. It tastes okay. It just smells bad. Like it smells like jalapeno water. <laughs> I'm forcing it down. This might be a five hour show. <laughs> One sip left, guys, and we make it. All right. Uh- <laughs> All right, <laughs> gotta go to the next question. Okay, James fifty one fifty says, Phil, will you be doing anything with the new EVH fifty one fifty iconic amps? I'm taking your fan since you're signed on as James fifty one fifty. If I do anything with the EVH fifty one fifty iconic amps, it would be because I buy one and I just review one. Of course, if they were to send one out, I would definitely do a video of it because it's uh, you know it's a great product, uh, great printing the fifty one fifty line of products. Um, but no, I don't have any. Uh, you know, I'm not on any of their radars to work with or anything like that. So, um, and unless I doubt it, unless like Sweetwater or AMS or somebody reaches out and asks me to, to do anything. Um, I can tell you this, my January is booked. <laughs> so, um, I started doing that, uh, in October this year, I book the month 
next month. So I used to just kind of as the month would unfold, I would have stuff to make. And now I've decided that's just too much too much work considering all the other stuff I got to do off of YouTube. So I now just have everything booked in advance. So like any if any company reached out to me right now and said, we want a video, but we want it in January, there's just no way. That would be no way. It would be literally, I'd have to, uh, to do it. Um, I'd have to justify, they would have to do something so crazy because I would have to justify like, the, you know, my Sunday off or something. Um, so I'd, uh, if I did, it would be in February because everything is booked for, for January. Um, uh, and that includes all the stuff I buy because as you guys know, I, I, I bought, I don't want to get too sideways on this, but as you guys know, last year or this year, <laughs> this year, I bought a lot of guitars that you guys requested. I did videos, but I made a big mistake. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things, it was the first time I ever done that and I didn't, I didn't, you know, I didn't not so much think it through. I just didn't really kind of think about how that would work. In my mind, I went out and I bought, like, I think we bought eight guitars, right? I went out and I was like, okay, this guitar, this guitar, this guitar, this guitar. And then they all showed up. And then, you know, it's hard to just make eight videos in a row like that. So I parsed them out over months. And what I learned was that's not the way to do it. So what I'm going to do, what I did now is I'm going to buy a guitar every month uh, and for the next month and then review that guitar in that month or amp if it's an amp. Um, and so I bought next month's guitar already. I'm very excited about it. It was hundred percent your guys' suggestion. Um, as I can tell you, I'll tell you, well, when I'm sure when I talk about it, I'll tell you like it's a guitar I would have never in a million years thought to consider if it wasn't for you guys. Um, so let's, let's go to, uh, more questions or subjects. Uh, this one says, Hey Phil, what's your opinion on collecting cheap guitars? Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Um, and, uh, so you guys know I posted, I want to tell you too, I posted, uh, that I'm doing the show early this week and a lot of people sending questions and uh, also make comments on the, on the posting on YouTube. And so this was one that came in and collecting cheap guitars. You know, this is a funny thing. I want to, I want to take a moment on this one because I find this is, I find that there's a guilt that people have. I have it. So I'm assuming that a lot of you have it. <laughs> Maybe a lot of you don't. There's a guilt to this. <laughs> Whatever this is. I, a lot of stuff. Um, you know, you work hard and you go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something and enjoy myself. And you buy something. And then, you know, you have things. And as you have things, you have a guilt. I think, I think reasonable people, it's real common. This, do I really need this? Do I really, should I have this? You know? And it's not even a guilt about having it. It's like, you know, uh, shouldn't I, you know, help the rainforest? Or shouldn't I, uh, you know, put more in my kid's college fund? Or shouldn't I pay the rent on time? <laughs> right? Whatever it is that you're, that you're contemplating. And th that's where I think these questions come from. And then there's also this weird, uh, as we know, the internet loves not a fight and an argument, because they love that too, but they love a side. That's really what it is. It's this weird thing. They love a side. You're into high-end guitars, you're into cheap end guitars. You're into tube amps or you're into modelers. You know what I mean? You have to pick some kind of side and then defend your side. And so if you collect cheap guitars, inexpensive guitars, we've had this talk before. When we say cheap, cheap does not mean bad. It means inexpensive. Okay. And we can mean cheap means garbage, but the word cheap is a slang term used like rad, bad, you know, right? It's, it's uh, fat. It's, it's not used all the time is the way it means. And in most cases, like what I think they mean is it's collecting cheap guitars means inexpensive guitars. So if they don't mean that, I'm going with it anyways, because that's the way I read it. So, um, this, uh, you know, why would you buy 10 cheap guitars if you could buy one nice one? That's a great argument, right? But that doesn't really, that doesn't really answer the question. And I'm going to answer the question in a way that I have learned watching you, you being viewers, and for uh, over a decade at my shop, uh, customers, and a lot of the people watching the show every Friday are my customers. I know. A lot of them. They were just my, you know, a lot of people used to hang out. This is what we used to do. We'd hang out in my store and talk like this. And then I went to the internet and then the internet kind of popped a little bit. And now I put my focus on that. So my my point to this story is, is that there's this like, why would you buy, I want to answer the question. Why would you buy 10 cheap guitars instead of one expensive guitar? And I'm going to tell you the answer that I've learned watching people on how they buy and what they do. Besides the, the easy argument of you should buy whatever the hell you want because it's your money and you've worked for it. But... It's because if you are a collector, not a hoarder, not someone who just buys things, okay? People buy things, right? To me, a difference between those definitions, really important, the word collector. I really want you to think about this for a second if, and, and who you are. This is rhetorical, right? You guys watching, there's almost 700 of you watching right now. Uh, if you are a collector, okay, 
A collector, in my opinion, is an educated consumer. Okay. What that means is, is that when I go and buy a blender, I'm not, I'm not a chef. I'm not a collector of blenders. I go to the store and I read up as much as I can. I try to buy the right blender and uh, it's usually worth nothing after you buy it. And on top of that, I don't even know if I bought the right one. A collector is someone who spends almost well, insane amount of time, but lots of time learning about the things they are buying T to the point where they're, wow, that was a jalapeno little kick on the end. Let me Woo. Okay. Um, I'm going to chug this thing at the end. I know that's how it's going to end. Um, a collector, like I said, back to collectors, they're educated consumers. So what they're going to do is they're going to know how to buy and sell the products. And why that's important is, is that's part of the fun, trying things, learning about things, playing things, being involved in the music. There's also a lot of talk about basically musicians and somehow guitar collectors are not the same, but I've always said this, uh, they are the same right? Uh, I, I just believe that in my core being. I believe, I don't care if you're a, if you have eight Grammys and you're an artist. I mean, even musicians like John Mayer have flat out said that they collect things, right? I mean, that's just, that's just how it works. Musicians also are collectors and you don't even have to collect guitars. There are musicians who collect Ferraris, right? You, you, you know, there are a professional musician who collects Ferraris. In my world, I happen to be someone who's made a living in music industry, right? Whether that be repair or guitar or our products or whatever, or YouTube, I'm involved in this. So there is a business aspect to this, but this is also collecting for me. It's also my joy. So my joy and my work are very connected. I find it no different than if a plumber collected, I don't know, well, you know, toilets. Uh, sounds crazy, but maybe that's something they collect. I don't know. All right. So what I mean by that is someone will buy a bunch of cheap guitars. It's not just because they don't have the means to buy more expensive guitars, but as you're, what you're most educated in, you will probably delve into the most. So for instance, if I have friends that only buy expensive guitars, not because they think they play better, because they understand that market so much that they like to play in that market. It's kind of fun. It's fun to buy guitars, play them for a year, and then sell them. Um, this is what rich people have been doing forever and forever, which is buying things that are technically assets, having fun with them, and then making money or breaking even on them, whether that be painting or cars. Like we make fun of people buy Ferraris, but I have a friend who, who owns a Ferrari and to get a Ferrari, you have to be a Ferrari owner. You know what I mean? Already. It's like a big thing. Like, so he buys Ferraris and he like drives them and he puts like, I think he says he puts like 5,000 miles on them and he, he sells it for almost what he paid for it. And he buys another Ferrari. It might not be 100% accurate because I'm not really listening to him because I'm never going to buy a Ferrari, <laughs> but that's the way it works. He's versed, he's versed and he's educated in what he's doing. So I think someone who buys inexpensive guitars and collects them up, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing I can find that's wrong with that. Um, uh, and that's just my opinion. Some of you guys are going to find some weird <laughs> thing to be upset about, but that's okay. Um, but my opinion is... Nothing wrong with collecting cheap guitars. Nothing wrong. To me, there's no difference between collecting. It's weird to me. Uh, I'll watch somebody. I watch, like I said, I watch you guys, just customers slash internet people, viewers, and <laughs> viewers are internet people. And they'll say things like, this guy has eight uh, hate Harley Benton guitars or eight Glary guitars or whatever, eight cheap guitars, and that's stupid. But yet, he has eight $200 guitars, and then but somebody will have 80 $200 pedals. That somehow is different. I don't know how it's different right? Um, pedals. I am not a collector of pedals. As I've said, I've collected boss pedals in the past, but I'm not a collector of pedals because I'm not super versed in them. I walk in a store. I generally know what pedals are worth something, but a collector, and here's what I mean by that. A collector is educated to the point where they walk in a store. They can usually see the thing that nobody sees, including the store. Sometimes you walk in and you're like, uh, for instance, you walk in, you see a guitar and you go, what? Uh, a made in Japan Greco for $50? That's not the right price on that. That's a made in Japan Greco. That's a pretty cool guitar. And I can get that and, and at a smoking deal. And it's not just because they want it dirt cheap. They want to, you know, it's part of the experience. It can be at least. And so, like I said, I find this conversation comes up so many times, which is the, you know, collecting cheap guitars versus expensive guitars and which is the right way to do it. And I've really come to the conclusion is you should, you should collect what you're educated about or want to be educated about. That's it. Uh, and, and also have fun <laughs> and play music, which is 
funny, the last thing is, and I feel like I'm on a tirade here, the funny thing about the music thing is this is a weird element that I've never heard, only the counter argument, which is you shouldn't buy guitars, you should play music. And I always say this, I just assume people who buy guitars play music. I'm sorry, I'm sure there's there is uh, there's probably examples out there where somebody has 50 guitars and literally doesn't know how to play them. Um, and as I've pointed out many times, usually when they say you need to play music, what they're implying is, is you need to play more, right? Because you suck and you need to get better. But I always tell people that's their personal journey to decide. Uh, because imagine if you took those attitudes towards actual real musicians. In other words, again, musicians who have had successful albums. I mean, what when we live in a world now, <laughs> not back then, thank God. We live in a world now where you could hear a guitar player like Bob Dylan strumming on the guitar and somebody put in a comment, you need to practice your arpeggios. <laughs> right? Uh, maybe he's good enough. Maybe he's happy with where he is. So again, so, um, so that's why, so that's my opinion on that. And the reason I say that to you, um, is because the question I find is always rooted in some kind of like, you feel a sh there's a shame attached to that. And I, I have a shame attached to mine. I think everybody has some kind of shame of like, maybe I should just have one guitar and just be done with it. The problem is, is, uh, there's actually, that's a great idea, but, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. That's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find things to enjoy myself. So uh, so that's my opinion on that. I'd like to hear you guys' opinion in the comments about stuff like that, if you guys feel this way or not. But so you know, there was a point in my life where I did have that mentality when somebody would go, I, I have 10 $200 guitars, and I would be like, well, why don't you sell them and buy one nice $2,000 guitar? I get that you know, now. You, and what I r realize is you ne that never ends, by the way. If you have 10 $2,000 guitars, somebody's like, why don't you get a nice $15,000 guitar? And if you have ten, fifteen thousand dollars, this is no joke. This is true. If you have ten, fifteen thousand dollars guitar, somebody goes, "Why don't you buy yourself a real vintage high end guitar?" <laughs> right? And like, I don't know, because this is what I like to have. So, um, in fact, uh, I can always tell you, it's very obvious when I'm collecting versus when I'm actually using things for my personal self. I play very basic guitars. That's what I enjoy: the SG, the Strat. Basic meaning just basic colors. I just enjoy them, um, but I don't collect them. I don't have a bunch of them. I usually have a, like exotic wood finishes or cool paint jobs. I'm pointing at those on the podcast listening. I'm pointing at uh, yeah, that's a Music Man Saber with a, a beautiful flame top, and then there's a Charvel with a sparkle job, and then here's a Relic uh, guitar. Um, and and so you know there's different finishes, and those are cool to, to have. But I, I don't necessarily play those guitars as much as other guitars. I'll play them, but I don't play them as much as my my basic guitars that don't appeal to me that way. So, all right. And then, uh, huh, uh, big idea 100, it kind of ties into what we're talking about. It says any shenanigans this year? Shenanigans is the term we use for when you do something weird, crazy, or fun. Uh, and usually about gear. That's usually my friend circles. That's what we call it. Um, uh, yeah, I did some trading and I got rid of some gear and I got, uh, well, that's where I got the music man saber, uh, with the beautiful top and the beautiful neck. Um, I traded some amps I wasn't using and, uh, traded some, uh, other things. And I got, um, oh, it's right there. There's a Jackson. I'm pointing at a blue Jackson right now. There's a blue Jackson made in Japan, uh, dinky arch top hardtail. Got that. And, uh, and I got a two rock amp uh, coming, uh, but and again that was again that was some trading. Uh, got rid of some amps and got an amp kind of thing. I had a two rock wait a long time ago. I think I miss it, so I'm gonna go back and try. This is a different one than I had last time, and I'm thinking from the last one I played and had this might be the right one. In other words, a little bit more, more, <laughs> my, my, uh, my speed. All right. Um, next, we have... What do we have? We have... Uh, this one came from Paul. Paul said... <coughs> dude, this jalapeno stuff is... Dude, this is crazy. I'm going to definitely have to chug it at the, end of the, at the end of the show. 
I'm curious, Phil, about Schechter guitars and artists. I understand Robert Smith, uh, he's talking about from The Cure, uses off-the-shelf instruments. I was wondering if you had any experience with a Schechter in this area. I do, actually, but not. I When I opened the store, Schechter was one of the first big lines we had. This is in 2005 uh, when we pulled in Schechter. And in 2005, my neighbor, when he found out I was a Schechter deal, who, a dealer who was a huge Robert Smith fan, wanted to order a Robert Smith, and he asked me if I could order him a American-made, like, high-end Robert Smith guitar because he only plays high-end Gibsons, and that's what he wanted. And so I called Schechter and talked to them, and they explained that they don't do that. They only make one Robert Smith guitar. It's made in Korea in the World Manufacturing Factory, and it's the way it comes, and it's the same one he has. And all proceeds go to two charities. And if you go to, I think, Schechter's website, this is, again, things can change. But I think if you go to the website, I think if you click on the Robert Smith guitar, somewhere in the finite print, it says the two charities. So basically, Robert Smith doesn't take a dividend. So there's a royalty usually on an artist guitar. Uh, the standard usually is 6%. I don't know if that's what he has, but that's usually what they get, 6% of what it sells for for the dealer. And... Um, and so, in other words, that royalty isn't paid to him. Uh, there's a lot of stories like that. Like Nuno Bittencourt's, uh, I don't, again, these are just stories you hear from the manufacturers. Washburn once told me Nuno Bittencourt's ro royalty goes to his mother. Like when they made the Nuno in four, the deal was all the royalties would go to his mother. So that's where they go. I don't know if it's true, but Washburn told me. So somebody at Washburn was wrong or right. And same with Shack, Shack, Robert Smith. Somebody at Schechter somebody who's officially an employee of Schechter told me the story that Robert Smith's uh, royalties for that guitar go to a charity. And because of that, there is no, uh, because of that, it's a locked in contract, which means that's the only guitar they can make. They're authorized to make. And that's the way the deal has to go. So there was no way to order a more high end one. So I would believe that story to be true. Then 2005, six ish story, 15 years later, you'd have to do your own research, but that's at least I can give you that input tells you about his character and, and uh, the company. Okay, next we have the magnetic fi magnetic fisherman. I gotta say, magnetic fisherman, you crazed you create you crazed you created a rabbit hole uh, problem for me. I started watching. I don't know why, but when after I saw you comment once, magnetic fisherman, I searched magnetic fisherman, and then I watched hours. I wish I was exaggerating. I feel horrible. Hours of this. I watch hours of Magnetic Fisherman. If you guys don't know what that is, there's whole channels dedicated to it. They get millions of views where people take a giant magnet the size of like a Folgers coffee can and they throw it in a lake <laughs> and they drag it out and they find guns and knives and bicycles and pieces of metal, of course, right? All this crap. And they just pull it out. I watched hours of that. <laughs> And I don't regret it. I don't regret any of it. I'm not smarter for it, but it was good entertainment. You know what? It's better than some of the some of the crappy movies that have been coming out in the last couple of years. So I just enjoyed it. So if you guys want to know what a magnetic fisherman is, it's literally someone who throws a magnet into a pond, lake, or stream and sees what the hell comes up. <laughs> so it sounds weird, but I would suggest everybody watch one video if you're curious. It was probably, you know, but, uh, but, but back to Magnetic Fisherman. It says, hey, Phil, if you owned an American guitar manufacturer and decided to make a budget import model, say Indonesia, what would you price it at? LOL. Happy New Year, uh, Phil. Uh, looking forward uh, to more KYG. Sure. Um, well, I've actually kind of did this. When I started, remember, my world starts when I was making basses. I was making basses, uh, you know, uh, out of my garage. And at that time, I was trying to get $1,600 to $1,800 for them. This is back in 2002 and 2003. So that remember, this is the, the way the story works for me is I start with making basses, and that for some reason leads to me doing repair and opening a store. It's kind of the way it works, but there's a little bit more to it than that. But uh, but the important part is uh, then somewhere in this uh, making the bases, uh, I came up with the same idea everybody came up with. And of course, everybody has now, which is, why don't I make an import version of them? <laughs> and so that's why I've told this story a thousand times on the channel about then. That's when I have them made overseas and all the hells and headaches that came with that. But the important part is I can tell you how I ended up pricing them at the time, which seems to be pretty logical. Um, I didn't price them based on what I got charged for them. Uh, the imports. I charged them based on how much I was charging for the USA version because I was using, uh, this is a tactic used by a lot of companies. It's called anchor pricing. It's a big thing in sales, right? So people tend to stick to the first number you're giving. It's why uh, it's why sometimes when buying things that have sticker prices or retails, that's an anchor price. So they'll say, this is $10,000 and I will sell it to you for eight. And the reason they do that is because they want your mind anchored or stuck to the first number, and then every number after that sounds 
much less worse. Um, a tactic I have used for many years with my wife, which is to say, hey, we should go to Taco Bell tonight. And then my wife looks at me and go, or we can go to a nice race, a nice restaurant. And where normally my mom or my, my, my wife would go, uh, you know, we stay in and we'll eat home. Now she's like, okay, let's go to the nice restaurant because I've anchored her into a horrible idea that I've now morphed into a better idea. So this is the same concept. And so when selling import instruments, I believe a lot of manufacturers will use that same concept of anchor pricing. In other words, if the American made one is $1,800, then the import one should be 25 percent of that. Gibson likes to follow that number really hard. If you look at Epiphones and Gibsons, when you look at exact versions, the Epiphones tend to fl fall right into that 25 to 30 percent price. So for instance, if uh, you know a Gibson's $3,000, right, you would see the uh, Epiphone be $750. Again, if my numbers are slightly off, I'm just add it real fast, but that would be the number I would see is 25 percent of that, right? Um, or $900 if it was 30% of that. So you get the idea. That's what they're going to do. And then the beautiful part of that technique is that has to do with anchor pricing. To you, it's like $900 is a shit ton of money, but it's so much less than 3000 that they've now been able to, to kind of connect your brain to that pricing. So uh, I did the same technique, not because I was aware at that time the industry did it, uh, I did it because that's just sales 101. Like if you go go down to the Barnes and Noble, <laughs> such an old timey thing to say. I went down to the bookstore and I got a book on how to sell and in a business, and it said, and that's why I, all that stuff is probably stuff I read at that time because I did what I think. Uh, well, back then, uh, you know, back in my day, when you started a business, you went and bought a bunch of books about how to start a business <laughs> and what to do. So you, you know, right? And that was uh, that. That's uh, what I did. Uh, now you just Google everything and watch some videos. I'm sure, but. But the point is, uh, that's what I would do now because it's effective. And, uh, and it also helps because, uh, believe it or not, uh, sometimes that works for and against their, their re the reality of it. So what I mean by that is, I, and I believe this, again, I'm not telling you a fact, but so much as, a re as something I just really believe is my heart is true, is that sometimes when the manufacturers sell an import guitar, it might have a, a huge, huge fat profit margin, just huge because of that anchor pricing logic, right? They want to sell this guitar for $900 and, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's a main China Les Paul copy style guitar and it's $900. And we know that you can make a light guitar like that for 400 bucks. You know, that they're, they're just getting huge profit on that. Um, but again, it's anchored to this, it could be $3,000. So that's a good deal. But I also think it flips on them sometimes. Sometimes they buy a guitar and maybe they have to pay $500 for it. And then they're selling it to the dealer for like $600 on very tight margins because they got to kind of stick to this anchor pricing. And so what you learn about that, that's probably interesting and probably helps somebody <laughs> is that it really tells you why you want to build a brand because that, that high anchor price is really, really drafted to the brand. The higher you can get for that high-end product on your brand, the more that brand will pull for the lower product on based on that kind of theory. That's um, that's what I think to that question. <laughs> that's my answer to that question. It's just a thought. Um, Johnny Love says, hey, Phil, I pinned this question, by the way. I just want to say thank, thank you to Johnny. And uh, I just like to thank my wife whenever I can. It says, Phil, thanks so much to Shauna and Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence, is, uh, Lawrence Petros Pedals. Shauna is my wife. And it says, I received the Know Your Gear LPD Dutch Overdrive Pedal Prize giveaway last week. No import uh, fees to the UK. Killer deal. Uh, yeah, I want to thank my wife because she's the one that gets that stuff out there. And um and she tries to get you guys the, uh, she's really getting good at shipping that stuff overseas, you know, things overseas, the prizes and giveaways and stuff and trying to minimize, uh, those I, we know in the U S we don't get any of that shenanigan stuff. We don't get any of that. <laughs> I don't, you know, you, you don't get no free paddle in the United States and pay $70 tax on it and their duties and stuff. It's not really common, but I know you guys all do in Canada and everywhere else and around the world. So she's been trying to, uh, you know, send the stuff as correctly as possible. That's legal you know, since it is a gift, you know what I mean? Um, it's not like I'm a big corporation and you won the, you won the sweepstakes. It's really just it's me giving you a gift. So that's, that's the way we're going to kind of flow with that. But I want to thank her for getting that out. Also, it's probably a good time in case a couple of you, there might be a couple of you in the mix right now going, Hey, where's my black stock pickups, single coils. Um, if you did humbuckers, they're out already. They're sent, uh, single coils. I messed up. I loaded the website with product cause it was in stock thinking, oh, this is great, not paying attention that my wife had no inkling 
to ship or do stuff this week because uh, this is the last week of the year. And so, like I said, we have a business. We have to button up as many things with the business, business as possible. So I was like, yeah, of course, business is normal. My wife's like, not business is normal. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff to make sure it's right before the first comes. So uh, if you're waiting for single coils, you will get them next week. If you're, get, if you're waiting for humbuckers, you should have them already or they're in the mail or you should have been notified that they're on the way. Um, uh, I love the fact that a bunch of you now are just talking about magnetic fishing. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, magic magic man says, "Hey Phil, uh, with a company like Kiesel, who allows who allows you to customize your guitar?" So that's the one I didn't I didn't put the period correctly. I'm sorry there. Uh, with a company like Kiesel, who allows you to customize your guitar, what do you think of monet What do you think the monetary value of that is? They seem extremely competitive price wise. What do you get? Well, here's the thing. Kiesel is super cheap for the price of a customized guitar. There's going to be a lot of people. Look, there's a ton of reasons why I can... I, I'm not here, again, to argue the the arguments that, that aren't real. The arguments aren't real for me are this question is based in, in, in the value proposition. The value proposition of Kiesel is real. If you don't like Kiesel guitars, like in other words, you don't like their marketing structure, you don't like the way they look, you don't like the way they play, you don't like the way they sound, you don't like the owner, you don't like the employee who wipes them down, I don't, that's fine. Those are all valid reasons why you should not support that company. And I would never argue any of those for any reason. Heck, if you just say, I don't like buying guitars out of California, whatever it is, your deal, okay? I'm not here to disagree with that because all those are probably valid points and I would probably agree on most of them. However, if we're talking about the concept of somebody making you a semi-custom guitar in the price point of high production priced guitars, in other words, making you guitars priced at, Competitors who are doing produced guitars, they are super cheap, which is why I've had so many made recently because I believe, and again, I don't have any, I don't have any insights on Kiesel. I don't have, a, like, I don't have a line of Jeff. I've met Jeff once at the NAMM show. He was very cordial to me. And that was the end of our discussions. Everything ever happened, every, any other discussion after that has been, I've been talking to somebody at Kiesel and they said, I'll run that by Jeff. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so again, he goes, you know, he's a busy guy. He's running his shop. But the point I'm trying to say is I think the Kiesel's plan, looking at it, is growth. And when a company's plan is growth, it's all about getting as many units out the door as possible. More Kiesels sold, the better. That's more people that know about Kiesel. And so what I see is a company that obviously, because they're direct to consumer, they're saving you money. And of course, they're pricing their stuff as aggressive as possible to get you a good deal. And again, all those other reasons you might have for not buying from them, they're all whatever you want to do. But if you don't have those reasons, then I'm telling to tell you it's a really good deal for the money. And uh, I that's why I had the copper uh, Delos made. Um, in the video, if you watch that video, I talk about my copper strat. What I didn't, what I, I put in the video that the copper strat back in 2007 was $3,500. Right now to get this spec guitar, I'm not talking about if you go to, cause you can go to uh, Fender's Mod Shop and kind of put together some hybrid version of that copper strat, which is good. But to get a guitar like this spec'd out, you know what I mean? Same thing. Um, you could say, well, this Kiesel is not a Fender. I 100% agree. Fender's brand's much stronger. It's going to have a bunch better resale value. All of those things are true. However, that being said, I already know because I've talked to them. $7,500 if you want my, if you want my guitar, my copper strat, I'm looking at right there. <laughs> For those that the, listen to the podcast, I'm pointing out a copper strat. If you want Fender to build that guitar exactly like I have right now, it's $7,500 and they want 18 to 24 months. Because, you know, I bought it in a time when Fender was a different company. That is a team-built guitar, but however, and a team-built guitar would not cost you that, but you cannot get a team-built version like this because back then they allowed you to, in a team-built guitar, do all the things I asked for, where now it would have to be a master-built guitar to get all those things. So, so that's why I did add Kiesel uh, do one because I wanted one and theirs is much reason, more reasonable. So um, yeah, I think they're a great cost value proposition. Now, the argument with the resale, well, here's the thing. There's a thousand reasons why I'm gonna tell you the resale value is gonna be bad, but the more most important one is this. Anything you make custom, don't expect your money back. I don't care what the brand is. <laughs> and you could say Fender Custom Shop and Gibson Custom Shop have better resale value, because they do, but usually that's the production custom shop. In other words, they know what to make you know, Fender and Gibson. When they make a custom shop Les Paul or a custom shop Fender, it says custom shop, but it's still produced. In other words, it's still, it's not like you chose it. When you choose a guitar, when you're like, 
What I want is a lime green stained finish with a P90 sideways in the middle and a single coil and then a tele pickup. And I want, right, when you start doing that stuff, don't expect any of your money back. <laughs> just, <laughs> so that's just, that's, and that's been my experience, not my opinion. That Every crazy guitar I've ever dreamed up and have built, the day I decide I don't like it is the day I go, well, there goes 70% of my money. <laughs> so there you go. So that's the, that's the thing. Val, Val, Valdos, whatever, Val, Valdos says, Sterling has the same color with a better trim. They do not. I have that Sterling color. It is not the same color. Um, this color is a custom color. They mix, they're basic. I don't know what they're doing. I'm guessing, but I'm, you know, obviously I've seen so many damn guitars in my life. Uh, they're mi definitely mixing some kind of burnt tangerine metallic with some kind of coppering color, coppering agent because this thing is really hard for me to pin the color down and the ca every camera I have pins a different color right now it probably looks more orange but I mean in some co some cameras or in real life it can look flat out coppery and then it looks flat out orange it's really really wacky um and so that's why they did it they decided to do something crazy and it was it was fun but um and sterling you could say that sterling has better trim I have uh I have music man guitars with real bridges and I have sterlings and uh, I don't know they're all the same they're all the same man <laughs> the Godo 510 is a is like a standard in the industry for a good bridge. They're all the same. I wouldn't say it's so. That what I'm saying is I'm not disagreeing that I think the Sterling bridge is not as it's good. I think it's as good. I just don't. I couldn't say better. They're the same. Um, but the color is definitely more unique than than the produced amusement color. Because I have that guitar in the other room. I have a a color that that's like that. Yeah, Disco says I like Kiesel's copper better than Fender. Yeah, it's wacky, man. That that was a crazy color they did. Uh, you know who actually, if you want to know, I'll tell you exactly who has the closest color to this Kiesel if you want it. Sir makes almost this identical color. They call it copper something. <laughs> Obviously. Copper sunset? I don't know what they call it. Something like that. Um, but you, if you go on Reverb, there's probably one on Reverb. If not, you can find a dealer. But Sir makes like this exact, almost exact same color. I've seen it. It's And uh, so I thought for a second, maybe that's where Kiesel did. They sourced the paint wherever they got, you know, wherever Sir gets the paint. They're both in California. Maybe they have the same paint supplier. Um, but looking at it over and over again, I really think they mixed it. And uh, those of you who are painters out there know that, you know, you can just mix a little bit, kind of change things up. But I don't know. It could be just flat out the Sir color. Okay, where are we doing? Uh, all right, we need to do, I need to jump in some super chats. Let me do that real quick. And then I got to keep drinking this thing. Dude, it feels like it's not going down. <laughs> I love the children. <laughs> you know what? I probably would have, I probably, thank God I came with the charity thing on this. I'm going to tell you, there's no way in hell I would ever drink this stuff if it wasn't for charity. Oh, don't buy this. <laughs> I don't know who this is for. I, you know what? I, I think I know looking at it. It's a tequila. Yeah, I guess if you like tequila and jalapenos, which I love jalapenos, it's like a tequila jalapeno white claw. Yeah, this is uh, this is great. All right, uh, Glenn. Glenn says, hey, best to you and your family. Epi, epi bird base bridge bushing popping out. What glue do you recommend? Finish crack on both sides of the nut. No, uh, no movement at nut. Okay, so we'll just let me. If we can, can we focus on just the bushing popping out? On the bushing popping out, you can use is just a type on wood glue if you want. Don't use super glues. Don't use epoxies. I really don't like those. The the the, the problem with the wood glue, the type on wood glue, it's not going to bond to the metal on the on uh, on there. But a lot of times, as you know, I have a video where I talk about. Uh, I like to wrap. I like to put a uh, type on glue on uh, newspaper, like paper, thin paper, and put some of that in there. And what I've learned is it kind of expands, right, when it's wet, and then you push the bu bushing in there, and it, even though it shrinks, it kind of fills up in there, and that works really good as well. Some people will tell you use toothpicks and metal, uh, wood and stuff. You can do that too. There's all kinds of stuff that works. I'm just telling you the technique that I use the most, um, but you use a very little of it. But if you just want to use some type on glue, wood glue, man, that stuff's like, I mean, that will work perfect because, again, it will kind of fill in those gaps and it might fix the problem and you might not need any other substance. That is the fast, easy, cheap way to do it. Of course, I would not be uh, I would not be thorough if I didn't say the correct way, of course, is to drill, dowel it, redrill it, 
and start anew. That's what I would do. Um, that's what I would do. But also, um, I also have all the stuff to do that. If you don't have the stuff to do that, wouldn't hurt it to put. And the reason why I say I talk about type on a lot of times, guys, a lot of that is the wood glues. Not only is it pretty much what everybody's using, every shop, every uh, factory, everybody using that kind of stuff, the wood glues. It almost does no damage. I say almost is I've never seen any damage caused by that glue in any way. It's water soluble. So, I mean, in most cases it can be cleaned up. So if you do something to the, your instrument and you put type bond in there and it fixes your problem, well then good. You solved your problem for $2.88 at Home Depot. If it doesn't solve your problem, when you take it to somebody to solve your problem, they shouldn't be like, oh, you try to fix it with type bond? That doubles the price. They shouldn't. There shouldn't be any problem with that at all. So again, you're not making the problem worse. You're taking a shot at it. And that's what I would do. Griselda says, Griselda says, thank you for another great year of learning, entertainment, and community. You rock. Cheers. Thank you so much. I appreciate comments like that. It's always nice for the ego. I always make sure to read them to my wife at night before she goes to bed. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's funny. I just made that up, but now I'm like, I got to do it once. <laughs> just get a, a list of, <laughs> I just see my wife trying to go to sleep. Phil, you rock. You made this community great. That's from Dave. <laughs> All right. Buzz Wilson says, hey, um, I think maybe the jalapeno tequila is working. Antique rocker. Says, Happy New Year from 40 miles south of Oroville Gibson's birthplace. Oh, cool. That's pretty awesome. Um, is there anything cool there? Is there anything cool to check out at his birthplace? I mean, there's like a, is there a, uh, like a museum to him? Uh, I'm not kidding. That'd be kind of cool. Uh, Buzz Wilson says, What is your favorite versatile bass? Have you, I have a couple of Lakelands. I love Lakelands, uh, which I love, but the string spacing is a bit much. Yeah, a little wider. Um, you know, it's kind of hard for me. I have a bass. Uh, when I say that is, I have my Warwick uh, stream streamliner streamer streamer. I have my Warwick streamer, which is a thirty-two inch scale bass. I have my Urge bass, which is a Stumac. Uh, Stumac. See, couldn't say Stumac when I was. I couldn't say Stumac when I was. Or I couldn't say Sweetwater when I was trying to say Stumac. Now I can't say Stew Ham without saying Stumac. Stew Ham bass, which is the Urge bass. Um, but I play my Jazz Deluxe all the time. I, I bought a Jazz Deluxe. I've had it. Mine's a 2003. I've had it ever since 2003. I play it all the time. It's versatile as hell. I, that's what I kind of learned. I used to have a ton of basses, uh, different than guitars. I'm I'm sure some bass players will disagree with this statement, but I I found it works for me. I there is no guitar that I could take everywhere and get everything and be happy with, but there is definitely one bass, and it's a jazz bass. <laughs> My Jazz Deluxe is just a jazz bass. It just is a slightly smaller body and. Um, and it has an active passive switch, so I can go active or passive. And that bass, literally, any if I want, I you know, I can manipulate it into a music man sound, a P bass sound, a jazz bass sound, you know, a more modern sound. Um, I, I can do anything I want with it, and because of that, that's what I use all the time. I don't, I don't. If I don't take, if the only reason I I don't use that bass is if I'm taking the Warwick somewhere. Uh, why not Maple? Why not Maple? Why not? Uh, it says, <laughs> Happy New Year, Phil. What's the most efficient way? to store guitar cases if a guitar falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it. Does the headstock break? Okay, I get you're going for the joke. I got gotcha. you. Now, the question is, yes, if the case falls, the headstock's going to break. So um, I do not recommend that you put cases stacked horizontally on top of each other, like pancaking them. Um, you can. I don't recommend it. I recommend them vertical. And the reason why I recommend them vertical is because I have repaired so many broken headstocks over the years, and those headstocks were broken in cases. And the reason is, is sometimes the cases, some weight gets pushed on the case, and that causes the neck to, neck to flat, uh, flex. And if the headstock is touching the bottom of the case, it snaps. Um, I have videos on that, talking about that, and giving you the detail. And, and in fact, if you look at my myths, 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 Guitar players believe uh, in there. I think there's a visual where I take a like a real Gibson and I push on it like a crazy person um, because sometimes when I'm making videos, I'm like, I just got to do it. You got to go for it. And uh, it'll show you exactly what I'm talking about, which is you can break a headstock on a guitar in its case. I would run them vertically. Um, that's what I would do. So there you go. That's how I store them. That's how I store mine if I store them in cases vertically. Um, Ace Valdo. Ace says, hey, Phil. Uh, 
I'm new guitar. My a new guitar has a Buzz Feeton system or Fetton system. I say Feeton. It might be Fetton. Buzz Fetton system tuning system. What does that do? Buzz, what he did is he created essentially the first uh, compensated nut for better intonation. So what it is, if you really want to see what a Buzz Feeton nut does, I really, really apologize if it's Fetton or Feeton. Um, is um, look up Irvana. Phonetically correct, <laughs> just the word ear and then vana, uh, nuts. Um, Music Man uses them on a lot of guitars. A lot of guitars have er, like a Irvana er, kind of type ear, ear, not er, ear vana type nut. And what you'll see is exactly that. You'll see all these uh, the slots have different distances, and like a like a bridge has different you know different settings you know different distances. Um, the nut is that way. The Buzz Feeton is also like that. It's just the way they cut the nut is so subtle you don't see it, and. Uh, that's basically what it is. It's just how they cut the nut and how they cut it on the guitar. It's just a technique in which they do it. He, as far as I remember, he used to have techs, you know, like he, you'd have classes you would go to and you could be like a buzz feet and one, two or three tech, like certified um, was a thing. And for a while, that was a thing. Like you would go to stores and you'd want that added to your guitar and and you'd, the tech would have to be certified to do it. But that's essentially what it is. But if you want to visually see it, I would look at those nuts. And that's essentially what it is. I really think, I think it's a great system. I, I've never had a problem with any of my Buzz uh, Feeton systems. You're supposed to also tune a different way too, by the way. If you look it up on his website, there's a different way he wants you to tune the guitar, a different order, a different style. And so if you don't do that, I guess the nut doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Um, but nobody does it. So I don't know what that means either. <laughs> but what I will tell you is if you want to physically see what you can't see in that cut nut and stuff, it's look at the Irvana nuts. And when you see those, like all of a sudden one, one slots further back, one's, it's just better. Di it's the string distance change to get better intonation. So it's to improve intonation. Uh, Casey Strange says, just bought a PV Predator Axe with EMG pickups and I love it. Do you have an experience with these? And what's your opinion on PV guitars? Well, I think PV guitars, especially back in the day, were really good. Obviously, new PV guitars that are imported are just on the same level as every other guitar that's imported from those same manufacturers, same stuff. I don't find them doing any better job. I really think, I really think when you import guitars, you really kind of only have, I've come to this kind of conclusion for myself, when importing a guitar, there's only three value factors that a manufacturer, a company, I shouldn't say the manufacturer because they're not making the guitar. There's only three value factors that they can add to an imported guitar. One, they can perform beautiful uh, quality assurance. So like maybe like Reverend or like Paul Reed Smith where they're and Schechter where they're unboxing every guitar and they're going through and they're making sure that the guitar is perfect and it's not blemished and not messed up and and it's set up correctly. So that's the value of having, even though Court makes those, uh, well, they don't make the um, Reverends. Reverends are made by uh, more. Um, Mir, sorry, M-I-R. Uh, Reverend is made by Mir in Korea. And then, of course, now uh, PRS is made by Court in Indonesia versus when they were made by World in Korea. Korea. The main difference, of course, is uh, the value proposition they add is they inspect the guitars that they're having made. The other value proposition is they can have powerful buying power and they can buy uh, they can buy guitars at a better price and also demand those manufacturers not not make any mistakes because let me tell you, you don't want to piss off Fender when you're making Squires. You know, that's a big contract. I would imagine the manufacturer would not want to lose that contract. So to ensure that every Squire goes out as best as can, I'm sure is something they'd strive for because you don't want to lose such a large account. The third factor is, is what essentially what we see all the time with the smaller builders, uh, which is like the Donners and the Glaries and the, you know, Ivies and the Ertz and all that stuff, which is essentially they're a small operation and um, they're just giving you value proposition. In other words, they're cutting the price. They're cutting the, the price so low to the bone that essentially when you get it, whatever you're going to find wrong with it, it's going to be it's going to be fine because you've saved so much money. You're going to be like, all right, I'll tolerate that. Right. That's just my opinion on that. I, I definitely think that way. I know some of you guys don't, but my opinion is very, my opinion is a very, 
kind of to the point when it comes to this. When I pull out a $2,000 guitar out of the box, it's got to be perfect. When I pull a $200 guitar out of the box, I, go, I look to see what's wrong with it and go from there. That's my, you know, that's how I feel about that. Some people feel like every guitar should be perfect, and some people feel like no guitar should be perfect. It's just how, how you look at it. But my point is, uh, PV, PV has those guitars. If you're talking about the imported guitars that are more newer of PV, they have those made overseas. And I don't really see that PV adds a whole lot of value uh, to that because I don't see them really unboxing every guitar and making sure they're right. So you could get a good PV and you could get a bad PV because they're not really helping to ensure that, you know, that the good PV is more likely than the bad one, but they could still be good. Like I said, no better than anybody else. If you have one of the older ones that are made in the USA PVs, I think they're fantastic. I think there's a lot of cool things about them. I think there's just a cool kitschy factor to it. I think I really believe old PVs, if they, if they, unless they like, they, you know, obviously the, the, Undercover Boss and all the stuff they've done in the past is horrible. But, I mean, other than barring than, you know, I don't know, Hartley comes out as a racist or some crazy thing. I think that's like, you know what I mean, that makes the news. I think that I think that old PV USA guitars will have a very collectible value one day. They're already coming up in value, but I think they'll have a huge collectible value because of the fact that they're, they're kitschy, right? It's like they were the guitar that wasn't cool back then, but now there's so many things that actually make them cool. They're very unique. When you look at a, a PVT series guitar, that thing's a hilarious. Look at them. The the bridges are cast, right? Because they, they were in the die cast. If you don't know what die cast is, it's exactly like when we used to get Hot Wheels and stuff. They they cast the metal into a cast, right? So they weren't machining them out. So that stuff's heavy as hell. That's why you pick up those instruments. Not only was the ash they were using heavy, but the knobs are die cast. The bridge is die cast. They were die casting everything. But it was all unique, imprinted with PV in it. It wasn't like today. It's not a bad thing, by the way. Either direction. Today, you buy a, a Sur guitar for $3,000. You get to go to a bridge. You buy a Kiesel guitar for eighteen hundred dollars. You get to go to a bridge. You buy this main Mexico Charvel right here. You get to go to a bridge, <laughs> right? You, you get a Harley Benton. You, I think that came with a go to bridge. You get to go to a bridge, maybe, uh, right? So th th those are cool guitars, but they all have the same bridge. Uh, you can actually get an old USA made PV with this wacky bridge that they made and wacky knobs and wacky things. And I think it has a, I think it has a cool factor to it. So barring that the company doesn't seriously just damage the brand beyond all, you know, be all get out. Um, I think they will be cool. So to answer your question, what I think of them, I think they're cool. I like having my PV Wolfgang. It's, it's, you know, it was a moment in time. Eddie was with them. There's a, there's a, there's a history to it. I don't, I listen to people all the time. They always, my, especially friends, I'll go, do you like the PV Wolfgang better than the Music Man, better than the EVH? And I'm like, it's not even really about that for me. It's just like for a moment in time, Eddie Van Halen put PV in the map and changed PV's persona forever, which is, you know, they went from the working musician kind of country rock band vibe, Southern rock, maybe. Cause you see Southern rock bands play PV stuff. You really didn't see the metal guys play PV. Not very often. In fact, never. You never saw that. I don't, I, right? And then all of a sudden, Eddie Van Halen made the 5150 amp and then the PV Wolfgang and it put it on a lot of people's radar. Put it on my radar. First time I ever saw those stuff in a store. I was like, that's PV? Like, that's different. So I think there's a coolness to that. So there you go. Now that's my answer for either one, whichever one you have. Dan says, hey, every tube amp, <laughs> what? every tube amp, 300 to $1,200 I have bought has a broken, wait, has broken. Okay. Or just has not been great. I am cursed. You might be, dude. That's all. <laughs> but I don't know how many amps you bought. You could have bought two. <laughs> okay. It says, or, or is the two amp thing overrated? I'm a gigging musician. Is it overrated? Uh, I feel like I got to go on record now, right? I'm like a politician with a podium. Sir, <laughs> how do you feel about, how do you feel about two amps being overrated? Well, when my grandpappy used to have a tube amp. <laughs> All right, so how do I feel about tube amps? Are they overrated? Are they overrated? They're a little overrated. A little, and I'm let me let me push the thought through. Uh, in the fact that sometimes amps that are just truly not good, just because they have tubes amp in, tubes in them, people go, "Oh, they're a tube amp." <laughs> I'm like, "Yeah, <laughs> but it's not very good." Like for instance, there are really good and really cool solid state amps like the Roland Jazz Chorus. And I think it's a cool and interesting amp. And I think it's a part, it's an amp that's made a part in history. And I wouldn't necessarily say like, you know, blah, 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 cheap, not that great tube amp is better than a Roland Jazz Chorus just because it has tubes in it. See what I'm saying? 
that's kind of my mindset on that. But, uh, but to answer the core of your question, Dan, yeah, you might have a curse. You don't have to buy a tube amp. Uh, that's the thing I want to really get out of this. You don't like, if you're, you know, don't, I know you want to try tube amps. Everybody does because they're great. And there's a lot of great things about them. But um, part of the problem is you really have to ask, it's all about questions. You have to ask questions. Why do people want a tube amp? Because they don't all want them for the same reasons. Somebody will say, oh, I need tube amps because of the feel. I need the feel of the compression, the tubes. Some people, some musicians just want tube amps because they're freaking loud. That's it, right? That's just the thing. They need loud <laughs> and nothing produces loud like tube. It's a very, very in your face loud. Uh, and to the point where you have to have uh, solid state pa uh, uh, power amps that are massive, you know what I mean? Massive PA style power amps that put out crap tons of watts to get what a hundred watt tube amp will do. And so sometimes it's not even about the tube tone. It's just about the, the, the power. And that's why a lot of them would just take really powerful tube amps and shove a pedal in front of it for the tone. The tone is the pedal. The volume is the amp. Now there's a little bit of a like interaction there. I don't want to kind of underplay, but that's really the kind of the point. So what I would say is, uh, as I say all the time, I like good amps. It just so happens that most of the good amps are tube amps, but I don't necessarily buy or need tube amps. If you guys watch my week uh, video this week, I talked about my Kemper, um, and uh, and uh, I hadn't been talking about my Kemper for years. Um, all I would say in the in the past was I'd mentioned I have a Kemper, a Kemper, an Axe FX, and and of course the HX Stomp, and I didn't really say what I was using them for. <laughs> I would just say I had them, and the reason is is because of these debates. I try to stay out of them. Um, I uh, I got a I got not only one, but I got a comment and maybe laugh. Somebody put like, "Why would you play that Kemper with all those tube amps?" And I'm like, I thought I explained that in the video. Sometimes I don't want to pull out all the tube amp stuff and go through that process. It's just, so to me, it's not about tube amp versus modeling versus profiling. It's sometimes I want to do, I want to just plug in the computer and I use the, the uh, plugins. And sometimes I want just an, a, a sound that sounds good and I can dial it up on a, some kind of model or a profiler. Sometimes I want to feel or hear the tube amp and how it goes. And there's all kinds of things to, to do that stuff. Um, Stefan says, you know, tube amp is the best. Well, I believe that to be true because of the averages. I believe that if you would, like I said, I like good amps and like I, this is how I feel. I like good amps and I believe that most of the good amps are tube amps. That doesn't mean all good amps are, all tube amps are good. And it doesn't mean all good amps are tube, which is really basically the same thing as I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is yeah, if you asked me like my 50 best amps I've ever loved, I would imagine that it would be a seriously like seventy percent of them would be tube amps, but thirty percent of them would be digital and 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 uh, and solid state. Um, and there's certain times where I would definitely pick a good solid state or modeling product over a type of tube amp that I'm not you know that I don't like. But most of the time I will lean toward tube amps. So that helps. And Dan, you seem cursed, so I would definitely try something else or try the type of different types of tube amps. You might be. And price doesn't dictate a whole lot, by the way. That sometimes there's a little bit of not nonsense in that. Uh, the eleven says, "Hey Phil, thrift store scored an eighty-one Ibanez Blazer with eighty-one, eighty-three Seymour Duncan JBJs. I think okay, uh, JBs. I'm just gonna say JB. I think it maybe JB Juniors. JB Juniors. Uh, I bought it to learn to refret. Should I sell the pickup to buy the tools or keep the pickup and match it with what a fifty-nine? Well, I mean, that's a monetary thing. You just super chat me 10 bucks. So I'm going to say keep the pickup <laughs> because here's why. Uh, the main reason I would sell, say sell the pickup to buy the tools is a financial necessity, right? Um, you know, your wallet dictates everything. <laughs> so I'm going to say if you can put out, if you can spare the 10 bucks for the super chat, I would say um, definitely keep the pickup and just, you know, buy the tools and, and, and I, it's not so much I'm saying you're going to regret it. I'm just, you, you don't seem to necessarily be in that situation, but I could be wrong. But, and I would definitely pair it with a 59. JB 59 is a great combo. I love it. And if you don't, the only suggestion is the jazz. The other one is the jazz, but I like the 59. Litve did an upside down smiley face like this. I can't do it. <laughs> oh no. John, own eight can't play any ruddy. <laughs> This is Happy New Year. Bought a PV HP2. Fine tuners are like tuning paper grinders. St 
stiff. Sandy, what's wrong? Is that normal? Yeah, the HP twos. So this is a uh, this is something I understand about the PV HP twos. So for those of you who don't know what the HP twos are, is uh, obviously PV made the Wolfgang, and unlike Music Man, when the Eddie Van Halen guitar signature model stopped, they continued with the Access, which is essentially what it was called before, but they continued with a non Eddie Van Halen version of the guitar. PV essentially stopped the Wolfgang when when Eddie left. They didn't continue with it. Then you fast forward to many, many years later, like almost decades, and then all of a sudden PV's like, we have all these parts to make them in the warehouse. That's their official story. The unofficial story that I heard uh, was that they did have all the parts, but not all the pickups and all the other stuff, so that they had the pickups and the components being uh, tuners and bridges manufactured overseas. That is my understanding, and I, now I think they even make the HPs overseas too. The point of this story is I'm not shocked to hear that the tuners aren't very good. They probably would have, uh, you know, like I said, that's their downfall. PV's just not dialed in as a company, and I think that's not a harsh saying at all. Um, so uh, we, you know what you got to do, man. you got to either uh, got to get new tuners or you got to ditch the guitar. I would say if you like the guitar, definitely get new tuners. But um, the, crazy, the good part is you're not crazy. Uh, I, I not shocked at all. Nothing you're saying, you know, that the tuners are stiff and not working right. Uh, you can try to loosen the screws on the tuners to see if that helps. What happens on your, on the head, the heads of the tuners, there's a screw on the top in most cases. And if you look at the, uh, the shaft of the tuner and then the head, you'll see a, a little, usually it's white cause it's a nylon, uh, like nylon plastic, nylon washer. And as you screw that screw down, it compresses against that washer and it makes it really tight. Sometimes you may want to loosen that screw and that will kind of fix that problem. And sometimes what you may want to do is take that he the, the head off and then take uh, the nylon washer. And there's usually a metal compression ring washer there, so don't lose it, right? And make sure you pay attention which order they go in. But also you can lubricate. The nylon, the reason they use nylon is because it's it's... it's like lubricated it's like you know it helps but sometimes they use other plastics and sometimes it's just not very good and then you can lubricate that with something um you know your choice like you know if you want to use you could probably use everything from vaseline to wd-40 to you know any kind of any kind of uh, gear lube anything like that and put it back together all of those things might fix it those are a lot less inexpensive it only takes a few minutes to try any of those before you buy new tuners and I hope that's the problem and that solves it. But my, my gut says, no, no, man, it's time to, for those tuners to go. But I, like I said, I'd like to be wrong in this case. And you just need to take them apart, clean it, lubricate it, put it back together, or just loosen it. Either way, I'll be, I'll be praying for you, buddy. Hope that works out. Uh, Archangel 1990. <sighs> I got to take a drink, guys. I'm sorry to breathe in the mic. I apologize. I think as it gets warmer, the jalapeno gets spicier. <laughs> wow, you see my eyes? Woo! All right. <laughs> We're having fun now. Archangel1990 says, Phil, I have asked Sweetwater for a deal twice now, and I received a little discount plus free shipping to Hawaii. Well, that's awesome because we, I assume you're in Hawaii, and uh, we all know, if you don't know, Hawaii is crazy crazy expensive to ship to um, and usually takes forever so yeah that's a big deal so thank you very much here are some here's some money for the kids college i appreciate that and he says uh should get you about four pages into a textbook 25 dollars yes <laughs> yeah it's not fun but uh, thank you so much for that. And I'm glad you saved some money and I'm glad it worked. And I, I and like I said, I, I hear you guys. A lot of you guys say, oh, wow, I, I asked for Sweetwater or I asked some company for a deal and they gave it to me. And I hear a lot of you go say, I asked for a deal and I don't. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with asking for the deal. Um, there, there's nothing wrong. Uh, like I said, I do it. It's my personal way of doing it. I do it with politeness. And um, I also kind of like, you know, the saying, read the room. Um, what did I just recently buy? I just recently bought something and uh, not from Sweetwater. It was from another music store. And it was a little hard to get kind of item. And they had one. And I didn't even ask. Even though I'm like, ask for it, see what they do. Like free free shipping, free tax, free something, right? I, I didn't ask for anything. I just bought it because of that read the room. Look, it's already hard to, you know, hard to get item. I'm just lucky to have, you know, happy to get it. So sometimes that's how I kind of do it. And sometimes if I buy some sweet water, sometimes I don't say anything. I don't send any message to the, to the rep. Sometimes I guess 
like I said. It usually has to do with, for me, deals, for me, usually have to do how, how bad I want something. If I really want it, then I guess it doesn't matter. I just buy it. But if I'm like, man, do I need this? Or do I really want this? I'm actually, a lot of times when I'm asking for a deal, I'm asking for an excuse. <laughs> Right. Um, you know, you know, uh, you know, like, Hey, if you give me 10 bucks off, I'm going to do this. And, uh, you know, sometimes you do it. Yeah. Uh, Jeff is giving me crap because the evaporation process is probably happening more than the drink process. I wish you guys would understand this is, um, it's not bad. It's not, well, it's getting better as it's going down, as you can imagine, but it's a little spicy. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> We're not getting a sponsorship from these guys. Ranch Riders Spirits is not going to ever sponsor a video after this video. But for the record, they didn't sponsor this one, but I'm just saying they won't they won't sponsor anymore. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, let me get back to some some questions and dip back and forth. And uh, we have uh, I'm I think it's I don't know it. Cyburn? I don't I don't know. PSY burn. Cyburn 21 says, Hey Phil, I'm thinking about building a guitar from a kit. Okay. Do you have any experience with this? I do. And it says, and do you have any recommendations for sale of kits? I absolutely think the Crimson Guitar Kits are the best ones. Um, I've built two Crimson Guitar Kits. They were fantastic. I would have gladly kept either guitar. Oh, both guitars ended up being sold into charity. And uh, why, I will tell you why I recommend them, even though they are much more expensive than some of the really inexpensive kits. And there's a ton of kits, and I'm sure a lot you're going to get a lot of stuff from people saying, try this kit, try this kit. Look, if you're looking for a cheap kit, there's tons of them out there. And I would say that uh, it's a pretty straightforward thing to find. Just kind of buy it from a reputable source and and get a good kit. But what I'll tell you with the Crimson Guitar Kits is this, and this is the testament, uh, the testimony I want to give. I made two guitars with Crimson Guitar Kits and videos. Both of those guitars got sold for thousands of dollars that raised money for charity, went to Guitars for Vets. Now that's the that's not the important part. That's nice because that's great to help the charity. But here's the thing: I need to sleep at night, and I don't. I wouldn't have been able to sleep sending those guitars to anybody, even if it was for charity, if I thought that they weren't good guitars. And I don't mean because I did the work and I do good work. I mean because they were good quality guitars. I felt good about those guitars. I know they overpaid for those guitars because they did it for charity. But that's not what I was concerned about. I don't want them to basically have a guitar paperweight just to help a charity. And um, so I really can tell you, really good kits. And that was my two experiences with those kits. And I would really, really uh, recommend them. And, um, and there you go. That's the... That's the thing. And like I always say, if you guys say, well, yeah, but they knew you're a YouTuber and they were sending them to you. Well, I always tell you guys over and over again, if that's your attitude that companies are sending me cherry pick product, when you get something that's not good, please send them the link to the video and say, I bought this because of Phil McKnight and this is crap. And trust me, I will always back you in the other words. Well, if you're a crazy person, please don't include me in the email. <laughs> There's some of you guys are crazy, but what I mean is if you have a normal complaint, right? <laughs> um, if you have a normal complaint and you're saying, Hey, look, this is not what I expected after watching a video from Phil McKnight and his video. I really feel, I really feel that my videos are very transparent and very honest. I'm not fudging anything. I'm not lying about anything. I don't overplay or underplay. I mean, to, to discretion, what I mean by more than just my personality, I have personality ticks like anybody else. So I might be overly excited, but I might be overly just, you know, disappointed, but those are my personality ticks. That has nothing to do with like drama for a video sake. And the reason I say that is because, um, I, I send those videos when I make a video, whether it's sponsored by a look, if I, whether a company sponsors a video and sends out a product or not, that doesn't matter. If I make a videos, when I buy their product, I send it to the companies. Most of the time they don't respond, but I want them to know it's out there and what, what is out there, good or bad. And when it's good, I can tell you, well, this is what happens. Every time I make a video and the product is great and I go, Oh, this is the greatest thing ever. And it's great. The companies will go, Phil, that's great. You get us. It's awesome. And then I start hearing some of you guys having a, worse experience, I really want you guys to take that to them because uh, that helps me too. What I really want to know, and, and you guys send messages all the time, is you guys know I can't respond to everything, but I try to prioritize um, issues. Like I've, a lot of you have sent me a lot of issues with GNL and I've, I've tried to respond to as many of those as possible and give you who I think you should talk to at GNL and the best ways to handle that stuff. Not because I work for GNL, not because GNL pays me, not because I'm involved with them anyway, but because 
I had a good experience with GNL and I publicized that good experience. And um, I want you to have an experience that's like mine within reason. Well, what I mean was like, you know, I don't want to hear like, Phil, mine is slightly redder than your red. Like I can't control that. But if I said the frets are good and they're, your frets are junk, there's there's a disconnect there, right? You can always get a worse, you can always get a great guitar when I got a bad one. And you can always get a bad guitar when I got a great one. But it shouldn't be just night and day. It shouldn't be almost like, you know, two different experiences. So like I said, so if you buy a Crimson Guitar Kit and you don't have a good experience, uh, I would let them know that, hey, Phil, highlight this video. Look at how Phil praised you and this is what I got. Um, and my experience with them is they'll probably take care of you. Uh, Grumpy Guitar Mike, what's up, Grumpy Mike? He says, happy new year and have a drink on me. Well, that's a lot easier said than done today. <laughs> God, smell. <laughs> uh. Just so you guys know how cocky I was, I was convinced I was drinking two of these. There's no way that's happening. For the kids. <laughs> For those who came late, don't know what we're talking about. We're going to donate $100 to uh, uh, St. Jude, Jude's Children's Hospital if I finish this jalapeno tequila drink. And... um. So that's what I mean for the kids. <laughs> I don't I don't want you guys coming and going, is this kid's driving him crazy and he's got a drink now? Um, ER Webster, what's up, ER? He says, oh, by the way, ER, I um, you sent a link on the last week's show. Everybody, just so you know, he sent a link to the making of that guitar I talked about with the, the Christmas telly, the, the fretboard. And he said, I think he says in the comment, it'll probably get blocked. It did. YouTube found it. It was a link and blocked it. But so you guys know, if you link things in comments, YouTube puts it in like a... Uh, like a pattern. Uh, that's the best way I like to say it. It's like a holding pattern. And then I have to approve them. And I go to the links and basically, it, you know, I, I just click the link real fast to see what it is. And as long as it's guitar related, I always pass it on. If it's craziness, I mean, there's craziness like, hey, date, you know, girls ready to date, whatever that stuff is. I, I just block that stuff out. But ER, I posted it. Uh, he says, I got a New Year's tradition. Okay. Got, oh, got any New Year? He's asking me, do I have any year, New Year's traditions? let's pen that let's go to the rest we usually have a boozy berries blackberries blueberries and raspberries in champagne and dark chocolate yeah um we have no new year's tradition <laughs> none at all um we usually don't make it till new year's <laughs> i do i usually watch tv until past new year's uh but like the wife and the kids they all pass out my daughter's at the age last year she went out for new year's at a friend's house so last year's new year's was like freaking out um but usually our new year's tradition is sad i, I don't want to bum anybody out it's just uh but it's true um everybody buys fireworks here now and new year's and they pop them off my dogs just really seem to freak out so we kind of lock the dogs in the house so they don't go in the backyard and stuff and then we you know just kind of watch something on on tv watch a movie and my uh my daughter's not going out tonight you know she's not going out with friends so we'll all be chilling out and watching stuff and um and I can tell you exactly what's going to be waiting for me. Um, we have Mod Pizza. I don't know if you guys have that place. Mod Pizza is where you go and you get like personal pizzas, but you put whatever. And so everybody put what they wanted. My wife went and got everybody their own personal pizza. So we're doing that. That's it. I think that's it for traditions. That's that's it. And as you know, it's because most of the time, you know, this isn't on a, like a Friday. So duh, done. But I can't tell you what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm excited about. Um, oh, I don't have a picture. I should have loaded in. Larry DiMarzio sent me this uh, chartreuserie board. I'm probably saying that kind of right. My wife says it so fast. I don't know what she's saying when she says it. Chartreuserie board, which is like meats and cheeses. Dude, Larry's a dude. That was great. He sent this to me. He sent one of these to me before as a gift. He sent it to me as a gift. It's from this uh, beautiful place in Beverly Hills. And uh, it's like wine and cheeses and meats and stuff and all from like Italy, just beautiful stuff. Like I know it came from Billy Hill, Beverly Hills, but it's like, you know, Italian stuff. And uh, so tomorrow we're going to have that. And uh, I'm excited about that. Um, so to, that's my answer to your thing. That's, that's it. Uh, Luke says, Hey, I have played a guitar. I've played guitar for about 25 years. And because of your channel, I now I'm able to own, uh, do my own setups and repair work. I'm, Dude, I, that's my number one thing. Thank you. That's, that's, that, that makes me, nothing makes me feel better. Um, thanks. Any experience with, uh, Fortin amps? Uh, no, I haven't tried Fortin amps. Um, 
But what I love about this is when you guys mention stuff now, keep in mind, one thing that we do on the channel is if companies don't reach out, I just buy the stuff that you guys mention. And it's not just because you mentioned it, but if you mention stuff over and over again, I know it takes a while. I know some of you guys waited forever for Reverend to come on and all this other stuff, but I mean, it'll come. Like, I mean, I, I don't, I know some, I've seen some channels say that basically they only deal with the companies they deal with. I, I don't care if the company hates me, which I don't know why they do that, but if they hated me, I'd still buy their stuff if you guys requested it because I don't know if it'll get views, but at least I know you give a crap when you watch it. There's something emotionally fulfilling about that feeling. <laughs> I can tell you right now, some of you guys will really do this and, and you're a little overkill, but I'm, I'm going to tell you, I love it. I, I've noticed this over the last couple of years, something you guys are doing. And I say, you guys, a few of you, it's like, I'll put out a video and it doesn't get a lot of views. You know, sometimes they tank, right? Sometimes it takes off like a rocket. Sometimes it tanks. And when they tank now, I notice like there's just this overly complimentary comments in these videos now. Phil, one of your best videos. Thank you so much. Frank, you for getting up in the morning and doing this. And man, I got to tell you that works. <laughs> <laughs> for for a while, I would always go like, that video tanked. I'm not making none of those. But then I read your comments and I go, man, uh, it's like weird. It's like, I was like, I'll work for compliments. Uh, it's kind of funny, but it feels that way sometimes. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's nice to nice if somebody appreciates what you do and vice versa. And I appreciate what you guys do. Uh, Chris says, what kind of glue would I use to put a sticker on a guitar but not damage uh, to the finish later on and be able to remove the sticker. Well, what what you need to know, Chris, is first of all, if it's nitrosose lacquer or if it's polyurethane. doesn't matter if it's polyurethane, polyester, all that stuff. You just need to know if it's nitrosose lacquer. If it's nitrocellulose lacquer in any form of those uh, lacquers, um, don't put a sticker on it. That's, that's my best recommendation. Don't do that at all. Um, everything else, I don't know. The you know I would imagine any kind of double stick tape would work. I mean, anything that's going to have adhesive to it. Um, I would imagine some of the adhesives have acids in them. I would stay away from that. But I would imagine most double stick tapes, I would stay away from thick double stick carpet tapes and stuff. But anything like a double stick scotch tape would work. You can line that with the back of the sticker. I mean, you're saying sticker. I mean, I'm assuming the sticker itself, for some reason, it's a sticker that doesn't have adhesive on it. But... Um, if you want to come off easy, you could use painter's tape, you know, and, and, and double stick, there's double stick type painter's tapes that are just notoriously known for that. And then, um, just be prepared that to think about putting stickers on your guitar. There's only two things you need to know. And that's, that's really important. You can get most of those glues off pretty easily. What you can't fix on stickers is that if the guitar and it, whether it's nitrocellus or polyurethane or, or, or uh, uh, polyester or whatever, um, they do oxidize in the sun. The colors fade. This is how things work. So colors fade. And if you put a sticker, what sometimes when you pull a sticker off, even if you get all the, the sticky goo off and everything, with goo, uh, gooby gone, jalapeno, sorry, in the back of the throat, gooby gone, or, uh, you know, you can use WD-40. You can use all kinds of stuff to remove the adhesive. The issue is going to be there's a discolorization where the sticker was. So just be aware of those things. I don't think you should be afraid of it, but be aware of it. <coughs> Definitely going to drink some water now, okay? I don't know how that just hit me, but like a jalapeno just hit me in the back. A little, little bit of that. Scorpion tail, as I should say. Uh, Declan, what's up, Declan? Declan is is saying, what's Declan saying? He says, by the way, thank you, Declan, for being a member as well. He's a member and a patron and a sports channel in every way. And, and I, I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, it says, thank you for this year, everything this year. The weekly live streams are mental health uh, recharge. Thank you for saying that, man. Uh, uh, that was a bad. That was badly needed. Again, I gotta start, start, start finish reading things to get to the period. Uh, he says weekly live streams were a, uh, were a mental health recharge that was badly needed. Best wishes to you, Shauna, and the family. Thank you so much, Declan. Uh, I appreciate that, and I'll let her know as well. Uh, High Desert Who Dad, I love that. He says Phil, you might try some Hatch Twenty Five Chili Al Ale <laughs> uh, with New Mexico Hatch Chilies. By the way, my uh, uh, oh, uh, hold on. Uh, from the Desert Beer Company, I will do that for sure. Um, by the way, I um, uh, my my parent in laws that's the right way to say that, right? Father in law, mother in law, they live in New Mexico, they live outside uh, Albuquerque, 
And one of my favorite things to do, even though it's an eight hour drive, when we go there is have hatch chilies in New Mexico is like the thing. So it sucked the last couple of times because their, their lockdowns have created so much problems there that there's a lot of restaurants there either weren't open or they went out of business because that, but man, yes, hatch chilies, anything hatch chilies. I'm, I'm on board. I actually like chilies. Like I said, that's why I'm not, I'm not having a problem with the jalapeno or anything. It's just, you know, it's just catching me because I'm talking for, you know, <laughs> to an hour and 40 minutes straight talking plus drinking jalapeno stuff. It just gets you just right. Um, okay. So I know I have super chats. I'm going to try to hit some non super chats. Uh, uh, Wanna Beetle said, I went to the job fair at Fender a couple weeks ago back, or a couple weeks back, and saw Ron Thorne and Red Dave again. Uh, Ron is such a, a damn nice guy. He is, dude. He's, yeah. Uh, it'd be cool if I worked there. Uh, yeah, my, my, you know, Nathan works there. Nathan, my buddy Nathan, who used to work at PRS, now works uh, for Ron Thorne. He works in the custom shop. He works He do, He do. works on, now he does all the fret works on your Jackson. So if you get a Jackson and it doesn't play great, uh, you can yell at Nathan. But <laughs> he's probably getting sick of me saying this stuff. Every time we wherever he works, I go, if this happens to you, just call Nathan. But um, yeah, Ron is just a great guy. One thing about Ron is, is what people don't understand, which is why I love I did that video. You know, I did the video with Ron Thorne. If you haven't watched it, it was what Squire would a, a um, you know, master builder at Fender uh, pick. And I did that video and I love videos like that because I went into it kind of like a, like I was trolling people. <laughs> <laughs> here's what I mean by that. I knew going in who Ron Thorne was, how that happened was Ron Thorne was in Germany at the Toman event. And when I saw Ron Thorne, I knew who he was not. I mean, I knew he was a master builder fender. I know he was Ron Thorne, the guy who makes Ron, his Thorn guitars, which are amazing. And he's also the guy who did like some of the swirl dipped universes for the new seven string reissues. And he does inlay work for some of the best. I mean, this guy does work for some of the best guitar builders across the country. Ron is in a league above uh, in himself. He does fantastic stuff. And he just happened to Fender basically came at him with the right deal. And I, I'd love to share it with you. He told me, but I, I don't, you know, I didn't ask him if I could share it with you, but they came down with the right deal and they, he went to work for them. Right. No different than a lot of people who are independent workers who a big corporation comes to him and says, Hey, we'll, we'll load you down, man. We'll give you the money and the, you like 401ks. And they're like, what's that? <laughs> right. You like healthcare. That's awesome too. You know, right. And so Fender got him to work there. And so the reason why I said I was kind of trolling everybody when I did the video, uh, there, you know, obviously a lot of people loved it cause he's great. And it's one of the best teachable moment videos I've, I've ever put out on YouTube. And, um, and I did, uh, what I tried to do in that video was I try to back off the entire time. What I try to do is let whoever's the star of whatever we're doing, be the star. And in, in that video, like, I don't want to see banter. I didn't think you guys wanted to see banter me and him going, and this is what I think Ron and Ron's like, why this is what I think Phil. I'm like, no, he's the star. Let him tell you why he, what he does. And he was great. But I love some people were commenting like, like they just thought he was just a master builder at Fender and they were saying things like, not negative, just saying things like, well, of course he's going to say this because he works for Fender. And I'm like, yeah, you don't understand who this guy is. His career is so much bigger than Fender. He doesn't really need Fender. He's just there. So um, great guy. And that's why I said about his attitude. He, he doesn't come across as, you know, I'm Ron Thorne and I've done all this stuff. He's just this normal dude. That's great. So I want to be a great comment. I like hearing that. And it's like always nice to hear confirmation that I want, when you meet somebody nice, the other people met him and he was nice too. Quentin James also remind us that rubbing alcohol works great for moving glue. Absolutely. Great, great comment too. Quentin, that's uh like I said, I use rubbing alcohol. Um, I don't use Gooby gone. I know everybody does. It works great. I don't know why I use it. Probably because like probably why Quentin's saying rubbing alcohol. I tend to use WD-40 and rubbing alcohol because I have it. It's right there in the shop and I can grab it and I'll use it and it works great. And I've never had any problems with it uh, ever in years and years and years. And even if people said, well, Phil, you don't understand it does this. I'm like, look, I've done thousands of guitars and never had a problem. And um, that could be anecdotal, but it's also what <laughs> I'm going to rely on because it's what, what I have to deal with if I have a problem. I, I'll rely on myself as much as I can for when there's a problem. The last thing I want to do is curse you, Internet, for the wrong information. I want to be like, yeah, that was my that was my uh, mistake. I'm sorry. Not, oh yeah, I read it in a, I read it on, <laughs> I read it on a forum that was okay to do this to your guitar. I never want to say that to anybody ever. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, 
a lot of you guys are talking about Ron. Hey. <laughs> Did anyone hear my stomach just now? If you heard a growling weird sound, that was my stomach. I don't oh, I don't think I ate lunch today. But that doesn't matter. That's why it's growling. It's just woo. <laughs> All right. You know, it's probably okay when it was not I mean, I started with a frosted glass. I knew I'm milking this guy's out an uh, hour and 40 minutes to drink one drink, but I'm not drinking the other three. I'm going to try to get my wife to try one. I'll try to get Ralph to try one. They won't. <laughs> okay. We need... Um... Uh, oh, you know what? This is weird. I'm gonna go with it. I don't don't ask why. I caught my eye. Quentin said, Quentin said, if you don't put spaghetti in your chili, it's soup. I only want to react to that, Quentin, because that's funny. My grandfather, who's from Texas, always put chili, like he scooped it, onto spaghetti noodles. And um <laughs> like it was just something he did, and everybody uh, we always thought it was weird. And I did it a few times and I'm like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, but not so much anymore. Um, uh, you know. But I mean, uh, uh, so it's weird that you mentioned it because I've never heard that before. Except my grandfather was the only person I ever seen did to do that. Uh, Derek says, "Hey, happy new gear. Two gear topics. Okay, we never talked about. Okay, picks and hands. Sure. Does anyone else sharpen their pick? That is a really common thing to buff and sharpen picks. I do not do that at all. I kind of wear them down." Um, uh, you know, I just wear, you know, I play them until I wear them and then, and then I toss them sadly enough. Um, but no, I don't, uh, sharpen them or buff them, but uh, they are very common to sharpen them to not only to keep them going, but also some people just, uh, you know, some players literally buy brand new picks and then reshape them that way. So that's real common. And, uh, I always recommend that to people. In fact, what is great. Here's what I want to say, Derek, what, what I like about the subject Besides the fact, like you pointed out, this isn't something we talked about too many times. But this is one of the things that I kind of will remind you guys about is that if you have uh, some some maybe 400 gauge sandpaper, 350 is probably fine, works fine. 350, three, 300, 350 gauge, why am I saying gauge? 350 sandpaper, <laughs> okay, or 400 grit sandpaper. I meant grit, I'm saying gauge. It is tequila jalapeno stuff. Um, and I'm trying to keep my mind clear. It's like, <laughs> but, um, uh, what I tell you is sometimes when you buy picks new and you buy other picks, um, sometimes you, we forget that you can really just take scissors and cut on your picks and shape them with sandpaper and do, you can shape other picks into picks and see what that's like before you actually buy picks. So that's a, that's a great, uh, topic. Cause that's a great suggestion. He says also can only play with one type. Uh, so he was saying like picks, can you only play with? And funny enough, I just did that video when I did my hollow, uh, Halloween, when I did my, um, holiday uh, stocking stuffer video, which is like the 10 gadgets I really like. I mentioned that the two picks I use are this, the Herco picks and the, and the um, uh, prime tone picks. And I explained that they actually have different tones and different feelings and I use them differently. So yeah, absolutely. I'm a fond believer. Different picks do different things and I use different picks. Um, and I have different picks for different things, but I, I mainly hold those two. And that's because I used to use Davis forever. And then I just kind of moved off the Davis. Oh, one day I'll be back. You know what I mean? You just get you get burnt out and you move on. I played Davis for years and now I'll play these for the last couple of years and I'll probably move back to something else. Um, he says, um, uh, he says, what do you do to keep your hands, fingers, ligaments, wrists, healthy rock on KYG? What do I do? Um, well, I do warm ups, and that is something I have, uh, uh, a video that I put on Patreon. It will be a while before it comes on the main channel. Uh, as you know, I did a bunch of those interviews and I did an interview with uh, Larry Mitchell and Larry Mitchell and I talk about the fact that as you're an aging guitar player, you need to do more warmups and he talks about his warmups and he actually talks about Steve I's warmups because as you know, he does a lot of work with Steve I. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, so I do warmups as well and that's how I kind of uh, do things. That's my regimen for my hands uh, is to, to, to do warmups. Warmups meaning... You know, I just start playing the guitar. I just don't go right to, you know, playing like aggressively. I'll, I'll play lightly and just kind of get my hands nice and warm temperature wise and uh, feeling a little better. But there's all kinds of stuff you can do. 
I don't use a lot of hand exercisers and stuff, although I've seen them and I've recommended a few things that are pretty good for people with arthritis and stuff. I've done videos on that as well. Um, and a lot of those videos I've done, it's because of that reason I know some of you guys have those kind of problems and, and, uh, and, uh, but I don't have any of those issues yet. Uh, my only issue when it comes to physical pain or issues I have to deal with playing guitar, when I play guitar for long periods of time, if the neck is a little chunky, I get a pain right here. Uh, and that's uh, in the tendon, I think, is where that happens. And and it, and I know when it happens, why it happened. It always happens the same way. I've been playing for hours and hours and hours, and the neck is just a little chunky, and it changes the, the way my thumb and everything feels, and it just kind of does that. And it's just a little tender, and to be honest with you, if I took one ibuprofen or if I put a little ice on it, it goes away in minutes or not minutes, but very quickly. Or if I just wait it out, it's gone by the end of the day. So, but yeah, you definitely have to do that. And I guess the takeaway from that is you definitely have to, um, take care of your hands and wrists. Uh, let's see what I'm going to need to do is let me refresh this and let me just say on the super chat side, Chuck, Pops is the last super chat. Please don't super chat after Chuck. Okay. We have Curtis. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Curtis. Natasha says, hey, Phil, in your opinion, what's the best 100 watt and, and or 50 watt all tube head with an attenuator uh, for hard rock or metal? Happy New Year. 100 watt with an attenuator built in? Trying to think, what ones have that? I feel like all my amps that have attenuators built in are like in the lower wattage. 50 watt one, I'm thinking. Hmm. I don't know, but for for me, hard rock and metal, if you're using a 100 watt or 50 watt amp, I don't think you need an attenuator. I feel like if you use a 100 watt 5150 or the Archon or the Bogners or... Uh, I mean, everything other than the Marshall stuff and me and even the JVM, you can get away with the same thing. I'm gonna tell you, you can get those amps. Uh, you don't have to attenuate them. You'll get, the, even if they're more powerful amps, you can turn them down and they still sound great because they have a lot of preamp gain. See, a lot of this is a lot of the older style tube amps, like the old, old school Marshalls and other amps. You really kind of crank everything because you got to get the, the preamp going. You got to get the power stage going. You got all this distortion, every dripping drip of distortion out of it. But a lot of the new modern metal style amps, uh, like Engel, uh, and I'm looking around, the Mesa Boogie, all that stuff has so much preamp gain in it that you can really get the gain sound you want and then just kind of adjust the volume. I don't, and you don't need an attenuator um, that way. So, uh, and uh, I know this is not great to your question, but like I said, I find no matter how good the attenuator built in the amp is, um, there's better ones that in the market that you can get. Uh, the Sur Reactive Load, the uh, Rivera Rock Crusher, the uh, Tone King, Iron Man 2s. I mean, there's so many good ones. Uh, and there's so many decent, cheap ones, too. There's there's no reason to worry about that. You can get in a good attenuator for about $100. Um, that will work for 100 watt to 50 watt amp. That works okay. So there's no reason to really focus on an amp that has that. In fact, I'd almost caution you not to worry about that. That's a feature that if you focus on that, you might be missing out on a better features that I would just get the amp you really love and then add the attenuator. That would be my best advice. Don't worry about finding the one that has that. Get a good amp and then add that attenuator. There, especially since a lot, if you do, if it's an issue of like you don't want more things to plug in the wall and do things with, a lot of attenuators are sen are essentially uh, passive. In other words, you don't require any plug in the wall, and um, you can sometimes mount them onto the amps if that's something you care about. So you just kind of one stop shop go. That's what I would recommend. But like I said, a lot of amps like that. And to be honest with you, for 50 to 100 watt amps that do metal and rock, I mean, I'm, I am per personally like, I like the 5150 stuff. I like uh, the uh, Archon stuff by Paul Ray Smith. I like the, I'm looking around my room. Some of them are more than that, some are less. I like what Ingle can do, especially if you can pick up your Ingle used. Freeman, again, is a little priced out of that, you know, high, but you didn't say prices. But I mean, I love Freeman stuff for that as well. Um what else? I think that's it. Okay, I was going to go for the jalapeno drink, but I need another water drink. Michael says, Happy New Year and some money for finishing that jalapeno beverage. <laughs> 
a, a dubious heritage. By the way, just purchased the last Blackstock copper headset. Oh, cool, cool. Well, then they're going to go on out next week. Um, the uh, My wife, I uh, was very excited. My wife changed the packaging so it's all biodegradable. <laughs> and I'm like, is that a thing? Is that a thing? <laughs> uh, it's, what, what's the beautiful thing about people in your life is when they care about stuff and you're like, all right, I need to care about that too. Why was I not caring about that? And, uh, cause I was like, I was, uh, what the first ones we used to ship, we had, I had foam blocks made and I was like, okay, foam blocks look so professional, put the pickups in there. And then my wife's like, when she, she would put the packaging together, she's like, this is just lots of plastic and foam. I'm like, yeah. So we switched it to, uh, and I think it looks better. So I'm really happy. Uh, Jonathan, says, hey, Phil, happy holidays to you and your family. Thank you for the entertainment and the knowledge you share. Have a cold one or a cup of coffee on me. I can do cold coffee too. And boy, I could use it because this is not cold anymore. In fact, is this cold? I was like, maybe if I match... No, I was going to say, maybe if I match the can that's still colder than this. Uh, All right, I want to answer this question, but I really need to take a drink, so give me a second. (laughs) Just suck it up. All right. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Chad says, thoughts on the Synergy mo- synergy mo- module system. We've talked about this in the past, uh, Chad. I used to have it when, uh, it was obviously Eggnator designed that stuff, Bruce did, and that was the Eggnator stuff. And then, of course, Avi at uh, Booty Camps bought it, and he owns it now, and it got rebranded to Synergy and maybe improved and changed, but it was definitely rebranded. And for a while, that was licensed out to Randall, and I've owned some of the Randall modules, and I've liked them. And um, I have not tried a lot of the Synergy stuff. I would love to. Um, sadly enough, I, I had a beat on that. Uh, I had talked to Avi at Boutique, and I think that was one of the things that were interested in sending out to the channel and let me kind of uh, do them. And the suggestion I gave to him, which he didn't say yes to, so it's hard for me to say, like, this was going to happen, but it was a suggestion, was I said, I have this great idea. Why don't you send me uh, a Synergy amp? And, I, and I, Not to keep, just to borrow it for like a year and then send me one module every month and I'll do one video every month uh, on the module, right? Cause uh, there's just no way to do all the modules every month. So it'd be like this, you know, every month you just do a video demoing which module it was. And if you have a new module, send that out. If you don't, you know, and then when you're done, you send it all back or, or if I fall in love, you know, Hey, give me uh, some kind of, they call it a uh, accommodation pricing, you know, kind of, kind of give you a discount and deal on it. And uh, then COVID happened. Actually, that's not true. Actually he had a family emergency, somebody, uh, not, you know, not immediately in his immediate family, but somebody passed away and, and then he's like, when it's done, we'll talk. And then COVID happened. So that's where it's been ever since it's been parked ever since, but maybe we'll try and revisit that in 2022. Uh, Nick says a previous talk topic. Okay. I'm getting into vintage game. Okay. But oh, okay. In the vintage game, not games like video games and stuff and board games. He's talking about into the game of doing vintage guitars. But do I think they're better than new? Question mark. Nope. <laughs> it is fun. Yep. I don't uh, judge anyone's purchases. Right. It, exactly. It's fun. It's fun. It's fun to. It's fun to collect things. Um, you know. I mean, people. It's weird to me. It's like people collect Funko Pops. People collect Legos. People collect things. Uh, watches. Guns. I mean, there's things you collect. People collect things, and like I said, they curate their collections, and then they purge them. Because there's always the thing about collecting is there's always something else to collect, and it's something to do with your time. And like I said, I've found over the years that people become so educated in that field. I know I'm kind of rehitting this again. That there's really actually not a whole lot of loss to it. You know what I mean? You tend to either kind of break even or whatever you spend out of pocket becomes much less than if you were just buying things. And what I find about that is is that sometimes they get called to the mat on that, so to speak. In other words, like, why are you buying all this stuff? This happens on, like I said, on the internet a lot. Like anybody who buys all these things, you know, is stupid or they're wrong. And I'm like, I've said this before. Uh, You know, some people buy, they go to the fair and they buy a jacuzzi for four grand. And some people go out of town and they buy a guitar for four grand. 
And guitar players seem to always react the same way. $4,000 for a guitar? That's crazy. You don't need a $4,000 guitar. You can get a great guitar for 200 bucks. I'm like, and I always like wonder, I'm like, I always wonder, like, it almost makes me want to do it. I'm never going to do it. But it always makes me want to buy a jacuzzi, see if my friends go, $4,000 for a jacuzzi, Phil? You could just sit in your bathtub and buy a bubble bath for $4. Like, I don't know. I don't see people saying that. And I think it's just, I think it's because we're so emotional as musicians and also because what they're saying is kind of accurate. $400 guitar is great <laughs> but that doesn't mean somebody doesn't want to buy other stuff and vice versa some of you will just want to buy a uh I, I have I have friends not very many but I have a few they like to buy really inexpensive guitars I mean really inexpensive guitars uh sub $100 that's what they're looking for all the time and they will just work on them <laughs> and to me uh it's horror for me to do that I mean, I just don't want to do it. I do it for customers, but I won't do it for myself. I'm not going to buy a $50 guitar and just beat myself to death for, for weeks trying to make it right. But I love that they love it. And uh, and it's not, I don't do it because I have an opinion about it. It's just like, eh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. So uh, Bill says, Happy New Year. What is your opinion on Stumac Wilkson guitar kits? I haven't tried one. I always wanted to try. They had the small ones, the mini ones on 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 sale and I was going to buy one of those. I really kind of, um, and I didn't finish his question. He says they look like the best kits out there, uh, with Wilkinson parts thoughts. I, I have no, uh, no experience with them. I don't know anything about them, but I was looking at them recently because they were on sale. Um, like I just said, I just bought $2,300 worth of stuff from Stu Mac that I needed parts, supplies, tools. Um, my, uh, my Dremel broke. So I bought a new Dremel at the uh, Home Depot. And when I bought a new Dremel, I decided to buy some Dremel, more Dremel parts. And there's some parts that Stumac has that's really great for your Dremel. And um, anyways, uh, my point is, I was thinking about throwing a couple of those kits in the thing. Remember, ah, actually, so there's the story. So, you know, when I said uh, earlier, when BC Rich 581 said, oh, if you do $2,500, you get free freight. And I did 23. And I said, oh, I had a couple hundred dollars in there. There was actually a kit in there. And I was like, I'll build a kit for the channel. And then I took it out because, like I told you guys, I'm like, I'm kind of booked busy for all the stuff I got to do in January. So I wouldn't be doing it until February. So why buy it now? You know what I mean? If I'm not going to do it until February. Um, so, Bill, you, you're you obviously thinking like me and vice versa. I, I looked at those kits. I thought they looked pretty legit for the price. And like I said, they seem cool on sale. So I don't know. I'd like somebody's feedback on those if you haven't tried them. Uh, Trev Wilkinson uh, is a great guy and I think he's smart and I know it's mostly a licensing deal with him. You know, everything's got Wilkinson's name on it, but I find like there's very few cases where the Wilkinson stuff is junk. Like he seems to, I, I was, I met, uh, Trev at a show once and I sat and talked to him for hours and, um, uh, and a, a lovely gentleman. <laughs> it, the conversation ended with what is his conversation ended with? I'll never forget. It. He's like, have you ever come to London uh, come by the, 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 he didn't say the apartment cause that's not how they talk. Right. Come by my, whatever they say, their place they live <laughs> flat. I think he said it a flat, come by my flat and I'll show you some Jimi Hendrix stuff. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> it was just a really nice. So, so like I said, I think he does good stuff. So yeah, I like the idea of the kits. Um, music, music, that's your sign on just music, music, not just music, music. Enjoy the channel. Have you ever tried a Fender DeArmond M75 Les Paul body style with a guild tag on the truss rod cover and gold foil humbuckers? I have not, um, but I, I mean, I've tried so many DeArmond products. So DeArmond was a company that was owned by Guild, and when Fender acquired Guild, they re they got DeArmond, um, and that's the very very short version of that story. But uh, uh, like I said, Fender acquired Guild, I want to say in 2002, that sounds right. It would be early 2000s for sure. Could have been a little earlier than that. They acquired Guild and, and like I said, Guild had already owned DeArmond, so it came as a package deal. So you see a lot of products, like he's saying, branded DeArmond and, but they're Guild, but some DeArmonds are Fenders and, and again, it has a, uh, that's, so that's why you have a DeArmond, Fender DeArmond product with a Guild tag. It's that, that Fender acquired those companies up. And, uh, and then eventually sold them. And I don't know who owns DeArmond now. I, I don't know if it went with Guild when they sold it off to, uh, I don't, who bought Guild now? Was it Cordoba who bought Guild? That sounds right. Uh, but somebody bought Guild, uh, they're in California, from 
Fender, basically. I don't know if the Armin went with it or if the Armin's still an in-house Fender brand that's shelved. Fender does have brands that are shelved. Essentially, a term shelved means that they own the brand, like SWR, Stephen W. Raby Amps. SWR Amps is still owned by Fender. It is shelved. Ginsman's, I believe, was sold. I think it was sold off when KMC was sold. Fender did not keep that brand, but they kept the SWR, but they don't, it's shelved. They don't use the brand. So, and my, I don't know the answer to this, uh, this uh, non-existent question that no one's asking me, but I just, in case you're curious, why would a company shelve a brand? Uh, in my experience, it's because uh, usually the value that brand has isn't big enough to have a, com a competitor. So what I mean by that is like, so Fender makes base amps. And so if they sold the SWR brand to somebody and they only receive like, uh, you know, I, I'm just making up numbers because I'm just trying to make this make sense. Let's say they got $200,000 to sell the brand because they don't have any assets. There's no like machines or any of that stuff. And if there is any trade or trademarks on the brand, but if there's any patents, they may be expired or maybe not, not, not that important. So essentially somebody would be buying the, 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 SWR brand, which is trademarked, and then maybe some formulas to the, you know, how they did amps and stuff. So essentially, let's say they sell that as an asset as two hundred thousand dollars, a quarter million dollars, or half a million dollars doesn't matter. The thing that they would have to immediately think about is, okay, once that brand's been sold to somebody, they have to compete against that brand now. So the question is, how much do they lose in sales if they go to that brand? And of course, if they sold the brand for $10 million and they lost $2 million competing into it, they like, that makes sense, sell it. But sometimes that's why companies shelve brands. It's not worth selling. Like Sun Amps, S-U-N-N -N Amps is still owned by Fender and is a shelf current brand. In other words, Fender owns it, but is not making any product under that name. Same reason. You're not going to get much for the brand. And, and then somebody's out there uh, basically actively uh, you know, working against you as a, as a competitor. So, and, and before anyone lights up Fender, like that's horrible. Uh, they all do that crap. <laughs> so, uh, that's not a justification. I just want you to know that's not something Fender came up with. That that's a thing that companies do all the time. Voodoo Fist said, happy new year. Happy new year. Voodoo Fist. Sean says, happy new year's. My new year's re resolution is to finally pull the trigger on a strat plus. What color should I get leaning towards frost red or lipstick red, but can't decide? It's a good time. They were getting really, they were, they were always expensive. Uh, they got more expensive and now they come down a little bit. Uh, so the question is frost red or lipstick red? Frost red. I think lipstick red looks cooler, but frost red is more unique. It's more unique color. And there's something about fenders and, and it, for me, guitars like that is like, it's always cooler to have the unique color over the cool color. It, it's just my opinion and it's just mine. <laughs> so definitely do what you want, but that's my logic. I like sometimes having, like I said, so something, a color no one has versus the color that's the coolest color to have. Uh, Grip 59, thank you for your super chat. Uh, Luna Mate Matic, Luna Matic says, hey Phil, I have a fancy beer. <laughs> oh, have a fancy beer. Let's do, let's do this with the commas and the, and the periods in the right spots. Hey Phil, have a fancy beer. And thanks for what you do. Uh, picked up an Epiphone 335, and I will be taking your semi-hollow pickup advice from last week's stream. Cheers and Happy New Year. Thank you. And look at that. <laughs> We're almost to the end of this thing. <laughs> yeah. We did it. I'm going to donate. I'll donate. I'll always do this the same way. I donate $100 to the St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Um, I will do it either tonight or tomorrow, but what I always do is I pick a screenshot of it and I post it on Facebook. Not so much to prove that I did it, which is kind of part of it, but also I'll put a link there too as well. Because I like sometimes when I do donations, sometimes it prompts a couple of you to do donations too. It's not, again, not necessary. Don't feel compelled to do it. I just, you know, it's not the worst thing you can do with your money. It helps charities. <laughs> Anyways. That they, yeah. <laughs> Here's a funny thought. Now, now I have this experience. I would have paid 150 not to drink it. All right, don't talk to me. Is the sign on it says give me, give the choice, given the choice, given the choice. Made Mexico Strat with upgraded boutique pickups or American Standard bone stock. Happy New Year's, Phil. I'm going to say made in Mexico Strat with boutique pickups. Here's why. I don't have but one uh, Fender Strat with the original pickups in it. So I would feel like 
Um, nothing wrong with bone stock. I'm mean, I like bone stock, but I would feel like I would probably upgrade the pickups. And um, so it's a tough question because now I'm like second guessing myself. Let's just call it jalapeno tequila drink. Second guess. The problem is, is I like Mexican made fenders and I think they're good quality and I like them and I think they're good buys. But sometimes I caution people, if you have the money to buy the American standard stuff, one of the thoughts is not so much the resale value. That's not what I want you to caution you about is that I always want to say this because I think it's good advice. And it's the advice I used to use in the store selling the guitars to people. If you think you're going to buy an American guitar, if that's something you wanted to do, just do it. Because what happens if you Talk yourself into like, I'm going to go a little less and get the quality thing. It will be quality. There's no real reason to upgrade the main Mexico to the Fender. There's not a real reason that I can come up with that. Other than it's just a thing that people want to own. An American Fender Strat is this iconic thing. It's been branded as such. It, it does have an effect. And if that's your if that's how you think, then, then, then I think that way, by the way. Um, I play Squires and I love them, but then I go, but it's not an American Strat. And then I go, why I say that? <laughs> I love this Squire. But so that's what I say. I would say, uh, you know, I would buy the main Mexico Strat and upgrade the pickups. That's what I would do. Uh, you, I would almost, and I never do this. I always tell you what I would do. Um, but in your case, I would also seriously consider just getting the American Standard being done with it. One stop shop and you're done and uh, you won't be unhappy. That's for sure. Uh, Brett's just lucky. He is. <laughs> he says, uh, my Chicago music exchange, Oxblood SG arrives Tuesday. I'm nervous given Gibson's spotty QC reputation. Okay. That's, that's a great comment. And we'll talk about it. What sort of issues would you live with? <laughs> All the ones that are on my Gibson's I'll live with. Cause I, that's what I've done. Uh, and at what, and what would you trigger? What would trigger a return? Okay. Great question. By the way, by the way, I've gotten your single coils ordered, so uh, that was a timely update. Oh, cool. Great. Uh, thank you so much for doing that as well. And uh, to answer your question, so all of my Gibsons that I bought have issues. Uh, and I, I've said this before. There's a lot of talk about this, uh, about these issues. And the question is, there is a there is a line that I think Gibson can cross and companies of course can cross, but we're talking about Gibson. So we're not picking on Gibson. This is a Gibson subject. There's a line that Gibson can cross where it's like, okay, that's, that's just, I don't give a shit, right? The employee doesn't care. And the employee's boss that's watching him doesn't care. And that employee's boss doesn't care. And you have enough levels of, I don't care. It just starts oozing out every, everywhere it can and out of the pores of the company in every way it can, right? This oozes out. There is that. That is a separate issue that that has been addressed with Gibson over the years when they've had those times, when they've not had those times and things like that can happen. And then there's just when Gibson makes good guitars. And I think, like I said, I have a Gibson Les Paul behind me. I have my SG behind me right now. Um, I have a Gibson uh, Chicago Music Exchange uh, 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 SG in green. I've talked about, like I said, it may, might sell it or not. It has nothing to do with issues. It's a, as far as I know, it's a perfect example of what Gibson does. It's just, I just don't know if I'm, going to play it because I it feels almost exactly like my other one, which is what I was expecting. But then I'm like, I don't know. It's a, but my point is, what's my point? My point is, is this. Um, I don't, with Gibson, I almost have to have like my own like set of rules because otherwise, you know, like this music man is flawless, <laughs> right? That's just music man. They just make flawless stuff for the most part. And Gibson's just not like that. They make stuff that just plays and sounds good and it's iconic. And again, there's a vibe to it. But then there's also this like there's always a thing with with it that you have to deal with, which is like a little blurb here or a missing thing there or something. Um, so here's what I would tell you. And this is like I said, this is a really weird way to say this. Get it. Play it. If you love it, you love it. And if you don't, you don't. And what I've learned is this, and this is the magic of Gibson, and this can set the internet afire or the group to chat so fire, but it's just how I feel. Um, I like my Gibsons to the point where I kind of ignore their shortcomings. I have friends like that. <laughs> I'm sure my friends would tell you I'm their friend like that. In other words, I have friends that have shortcomings, but I like them so much, I don't really care. You know what I mean? Uh... And that's, that's really what it comes down to. At some point, I don't really go, oh, man, two grand, and it's got a, you know, the you know the thing wrong with the blim and the paint. I'm just like, if I love it, and it plays great, it sounds great, and I love looking at it, and 
if that one thing bugging me that I'm not happy, then I understand your problem. But for me, most of the time, it's like everything else checks, and this isn't much different. And that's what I said. One thing Gibson's done almost as a favor to people, their QC's been so dodgy for so long on so many things that all the used ones get a pass. Like every, like no one buys used Gibsons going, is it flaw? Like try to buy, a, try to get somebody to buy a used Paul Reed Smith. It better be perfect. Like a chip is like, oh, it's chipped. No, oh, eh. yeah, I know it's three grand new, but you, you can't get that now. But man, you can have nicks and bruises in a Gibson or a flaw. And it's, it's <laughs> Brent. Bent Tom says buy a Nags instead. Nags is beautiful guitars, but they're a different animal. Like I said, Gibson and you gotta understand Gibson and Fender play in a in a world of themselves. They they have something that's different than everyone else has for the most part, which is they have this legacy to sell off of, and that's what they market to. And again, I'm not saying that's what makes it great. Uh, and I'm like, you should buy it. I'm saying that's usually what you're drawn to is this thing. Uh, if I want quality, I know where there's just quality at. I mean, like I said, it doesn't even have to be. Think of this. I don't even cite like like a perfect example. Let's see, like Nags. Nags is a beautiful guitars, beautiful quality, four grand, five grand. I love Joe Nags. I love his stuff. I love their guitars. However, I can tell you, I can find guitars for five hundred dollars that are also awesome too. I'm not gonna say as good as Nags because that's not where we're gonna go with this. What I'm gonna say is they're fantastic. So, I don't think you buy a Gibson uh, guitar like that to go, oh, I'm unhappy with the quality of my $600 Schecter. I'm going to get a Gibson for quality. I think you buy a Gibson because you just that's what it is. You just want this guitar for all these reasons. It's iconic status. It's cool. It's got cool cat. It's got cool cred. Cool's thing, right? Otherwise, think about this. If cool didn't matter in so many ways, then like everybody would wear the same color clothes, the same clothes. We would have white t-shirts with white pants and <laughs> with white shoes, and everybody would drive the same white car, and, or, you know, it can be all black, I care less, or blue, or whatever, just pick a color. But the point is, it would all be just as boring stuff. And it, it, you got to have flavors in life. And, and that's just what Gibson adds to it. Um, and and that, that's what it is. Hold on, I'm reading some comments. Um, so to, to answer your question, I would definitely go through the guitar and look for those issues and stuff. And if there's issues, you know, and there's a problem, uh, send it back. But I would look for like I said, quality issues, you shouldn't have to, you shouldn't need my opinion to know what the quality issues on that guitar is. Um, because really what it should be is, is if something bugs you, it bugs you. Um, when I got my ES-335 from Gibson, I did that review. And in that review, um, I stated, which is what bugged me, the fretboard, which is something new on all, a lot of the newer Gibsons are like this. Like the fretboard's rough. It feels like somebody took it down to like, I don't know, like serious, like 250 grit. 200 grit, not nah, 200 grit sandpaper. It doesn't feel finished. It's weird to me. And uh, so I finished it. I polished it and um, I made it better. And, you know, that's, that guitar was expensive. Uh, a, a brand new Gibson ES-335 was an expensive guitar. I would never, never have expected to see that kind of quality come out of an Epiphone. It would have been much better as an Epiphone. But like I said in the video, there's just something I always wanted to get on a Gibson 335. It was just this thing. If I just wanted the sound of a 335, if I just wanted a quality guitar, well, then I would have been an Epiphone or a Sire or a ton of other brands. But I wanted to own a Gibson. It was just something I wanted to own. And one of the great things about Gibson and Fender and a lot of brands like that is uh, they're a lot of money, but they hold a lot of value. So, you know, and that's another thing, too. So, this is, again, it's interesting. I, like I said, uh, Travis did a super chat. Thank you, man. Happy New Year. Dave the Pious. I'm going to say that. It says, I have an Ibanez RG <laughs> RT421 hardtail. And the furls fell out. <laughs> yeah, that was a little time on guitars. Uh, the furls fall out uh, without the strings. Yep. Any recommendations to get them to stay in? Sure, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, so they do. What happens is the wood shrinks and uh, it dries out and it shrinks. And as it shrinks, you think that it's going to, as it dries out, you think it would like kind of hold them in tighter and so they just fall out. Um, there's a ton of things you can do. You can run, uh, you can wrap a strip of silicone plumber's tape around them and stick them back in. That works. But again, you just got to do it right. Um, you can put a dot of, uh, type on wood glue. Like I said, put a, put a dot on, uh, kind of just put a dot on your finger and rub it in the, in the hole and then stick the furl in there. And again, it won't bond to the, to the metal, but it will kind of like fill the gap a little bit. So the compression can hold a little bit and, and maybe make it tacky a little bit. So it holds in there. Uh, that is very easy. What I would, again, what I caution you guys not to do is don't stick super glue in there. Um, 
The, the reason I say that is when you guys do that stuff, super glued epoxy and all that stuff, sometimes that stuff falls out anyways. And then I'm just in there with a round file, filing that crap out of there and trying to clean it when I'm fixed, when I'm fixing it. Um, the, I would, you don't need new furls. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be an issue at all. Um, if you were to use super glue, which I don't recommend, um, you would do, you would take a furl and every one of them, you put one dot on them around the edge so that it doesn't squish out and, you know, be visible. And that would kind of hold it in place. But that's all you do. Because keep in mind, I mean, really the problem is the only thing about them falling out besides being the pain in the ass factor is your fear of losing one or two when the string you take the strings off. So you just need something to kind of hold them in place. And that, like I said, a little little bit of little bit of type on wood glue in there would be more than perfect. You know what I mean? I actually seen this. I've seen people use this Elmer's paper, you know, white glue and it works, but I wouldn't use that. But I mean, it works. And again, if you don't want to use the glue, you just take a nylon pump, uh, plumber's tape and just do that. Um, it's just a little bit more tricky because it gets smushed. So again, uh, Mr. Walling Guitar says, I appreciate you, Phil. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, Matthew Perkins says, PV6505. Or EVH fifty one fifty. I did that video, uh, but I did it on the minis, not the full size. Um, huh. I don't know. I like the fifty one fifty more. I think there's some merit to the sixty five five. So to me, the sixty five five is the old PV fifty one fifty. I like the PV fifty one fifty distortion. I've never liked the PV fifty one fifty clean. I haven't tried. There's like a new version of the sixty five oh five. It may be even better. I'm not the plus. Like there's even a newer version. Um, the 6505 is a great amp. I just prefer the 5150's clean channel better than it. But also, with the price difference, I mean, the 6505 is great. So me, personally, barring the price difference, I would pick the 5150 to get the clean channel I like. Um, but other than that, no, man. If you could score a 6505 uh, for a great price, it's a great amp. And it, and it definitely is in the same league as quality is to me and sound. And if sometimes a lot of players like them better, the distortion better on the PV ones. I find them to be so similar that... Although I could argue points on either direction, I don't really look at it that way. Like I said, I just noticed that on the PV's clean, it's a little different than I like. It's a little crunchier and brighter. And I can get the 5150, especially if you're talking about the 100 watt head, uh, you can get the clean a little better. Now, if we're talking about the mini heads, because I've done that shootout before, I love the features of the, of the 6505 on the mini. Blows everything that 5150's done, but I think overall, overwhelmingly, the tone on the 5150 mini head is better than those, the PV. So straight up, just for the sound, I would do the 5150, but for the idea of having a pedal platform and all the other features, the 6505. Uh, Saul says, hey, Phil, I just got a new LTD KH Kirk Hammett 202 opinion on the guitar. Also, I'm looking for a nice $300, $400 amp to pair it with. Any ideas? I'm assuming you got a KH, you like distortion, right? I mean, you know, because you got the Kirk Hammett guitar. I, I like LTD. I like ESP. That's right. I've read them and I've always liked them. Um, I'm a Metallica fan for sure. Without a doubt. So that's a cool guitar. So that my opinion on the guitar is I like Kirk Hammond. I like LTD. It's got to be a cool guitar and that right alone. Um, for an amp for three to $400 to pair it with, uh, <laughs> right now, again, Katana. They always say Katana. But I'm thinking like, uh, um, what what would I say? Hmm, three to $400. I mean, that's a tough price point because it's like right in the sweet spot because you get a little less, you're going to get something which you're not going to get... Um, I would say Black Star is good. A lot of people are going to freak out when I say that, but I like Black Star. Uh, I've had good experiences with them as a whole. Um, they are a little bit, you know, they're on the cheap side. So when they go out, they go out. They're going to go toss them. But that's kind of the world you live in if you're going to buy the amps at that price point. You got to understand, amps are expensive. And so when you see three to $400 amps, especially when you get metal and stuff. Um, Jet City amps are great if you can find those, score them. I'm going to tr try to push you towards a lot of used stuff because there's a lot of good you know, good use amps in the three to four hundred range. Agnator's got good stuff at that price range. Uh, Jet City, I already said them. Um, Black Star is good at that price range. What else is cool at that price range? And again, because I'm assuming you like metal, Mesa Boogie is going to be out of that price range. There's just no way you're in that le in that price. And um, I'm trying to do one more. Oh, you know what? That 6505 Mini, if you could score one of those used for three to $400, that would be fantastic as well. That's uh, That would be a great amp too. I don't know if you want a Mini or if you want a combo or whatever. Those are all those are all cool amps. Uh, Matt says, have you tried Stumac Fret Bar 
underdressing leveler. I have seen it. I actually have. Okay, well, let me finish the question. Wanting to learn to level my own frets and it makes uh, make sure it's quality tools. So um, I haven't tried theirs, but uh, believe it or not, a friend, or I shouldn't say friend. He's an acquaintance. I mean, he's my friend, but I mean, I'm you know. Um, he was a customer in my store and he went to Roberto Venn to become a luthier and he started working at Guitar Center and I went there one day and he saw me and uh, we said hi and he gave me a tool that works exactly like that, but it was a little better and he made it. So I use that. So to answer your question, what do I think of the under, uh, understring save, uh, leveler? I like the idea of it and I have one that's better because somebody made me one out of a machine aluminum. And um, But it's like, look, they almost look identical, but mine's longer and wider and just a little nicer. I like the white width of it. And uh, so I'm going to imagine that it's got to be just as good as this or in some way. Chuck Pops. I'm going to say Pops. Pops says, greetings. Really enjoying the Patreon content. Uh, curious if you ever get around to checking our uh, out, checking out our bootlegger guitar. 25 bucks for a growler. Oh, yeah, to get a jalapeno taste out of your mouth. Okay. Um, I have not checked out bootlegger guitars. Um. um Bootlegger, I, I know so many channels who have checked out a bootlegger and everything they tell me personally is they're fantastic. So it's one of those things. I don't, uh, it's one of those things. I guess I'll have to buy one and get one on the channel. They, um, they are, I, I haven't physically touched one, but I mean, it's one thing if you said, oh, I saw a lot of videos about them. Good. But I mean, I literally know the people that made the videos, a lot of those channels and in passing discussion, they've discussed it as being really cool. So really cool guitars. So bootlegger is a guitar I would definitely check out for sure. Thank you for the growler. And yes, I will definitely want to get this uh, taste in my mouth. I Sometimes I'm like, oh, I'll come back to something a day later and go, wasn't that bad? I'll try it again. But I have a feeling I'm done with this. <laughs> like <it's... laughs> All right. On that note, we've hit the end of the show. I finished the drink. We've do the donation. We talked amps. We talked guitars. We talked everything else. Um, yeah, Max, Guitar Max did it. Somebody said, John Croft said, uh, Guitar uh, Guitar Max did one. He did one. It was a great one. He, I think he's the one that mentioned that it was great. Um, and um, so those who are interested in a good video, he did one that was really good. You can check his out in the meantime. Um, Dale Palmer said, Happy New Year. I want to wish every single one of you a Happy New Year. Vimps69, thank you guys so much for, for being members. Thank you for the patrons. Thank you guys for hanging out. Um, <laughs> I want to take a drink of water. I kind of want to get off the air because of my throat. Not that it was bad, but I got a tickle about four drinks ago in the back from the from the jalapeno. Um, so, but that note, uh, I want to wish everybody a happy new year. I want to thank you guys so much for being part of the show every Friday, supporting the channel. I have some really good news uh, to share with you at the end. So I want to share with you now for those who want to hang out at the end, which is that next month, obviously, like I said, I'm booked and there's some really cool stuff that I'm reviewing, really stuff, really cool stuff, videos that I have coming out that are not reviews. And um, and I, and if you notice, I backed off a little bit during the holidays on the videos. I don't know if you guys noticed, some of you didn't, some of you didn't, that I actually in December, I made less videos than I did in November and uh, and uh, in October and stuff. And that was because as the, cause the ad rates were higher, I got paid a little bit more on those videos. So I kind of felt like I could leave the videos alone and not work it and work harder on the videos I want to put out in January and February. So I'm really excited about those. I think you guys are going to like them too. Um, uh, kind of like, you know, more stuff on content that we're really interested in. And, um, and uh, on that note, I want to thank everyone. Please be safe out there. Please have fun. Please play guitar, because like I said uh, years before, this is the one night where the neighbors don't call the cops. Turn up those amps. If you do have those amps that you've been attenuating down and turning down and putting pedals and turn them up tonight, this is the night to do it. Uh, and uh, as always, I want to thank you guys so much for your time. Next week, the show will be back to its normal time, which is 3 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And of course, I'll have videos out be, uh, before then. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Declan, David, all you guys. I wish I could say all your names. There's just too many of you. And uh, But I wanted you to know I want to thank you guys for hanging out. Till the next time, uh, know your gear.